Samsonite for all that you've done to me. Ma'am, good morning. Can you state your full name and date of birth for the record for us? Sarah Boone, 101077. All right, Ms. Boone is seated at council's table wearing a black blazer and a dark blue blouse. She is in custody. However, she is not in any restraints, so we will continue to stand uh, while the jury panel enters and exits. Ms. Boone, are you still satisfied with your lawyer's representation of you in this matter? Absolutely. Are you still on board with the strategy that they have implore, employed in the use uh, of your defense? Yes. All right. Let's go ahead and stand and bring in our panel. All right. Everyone will be seated. Thank you. Members of our jury, good morning. Welcome back to 12 Alpha of the Orange County Courthouse. Uh, thank you again for your time, your attention, and your sacrifice in this matter. State, if you could please recall Detective Kepsel. State would uh, call Detective Kepsel. Mr. Castori, you may proceed. Your Honor, we had tendered the witness to the defense. Okay, thank you. Mr. Henderson, you may proceed with any cross-examination. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Blacklock is back on the case. Now, it's my understanding that on February 24th, 2020, you responded to this crime scene. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, were you the first officer to respond to the crime scene? No. So there were other officers who were there prior to you arriving, is that correct? Yes. Were you the first detective to respond to the crime scene? Uh, my, myself and my partner, we all arrived at the same time because we left from the same location at the same time. Okay, and who is your partner? Now? Detective Scott Lowen. Throughout the whole time, you and uh, Detective Lowen worked on this case together, is that correct? Yes, he assisted me with this case. Now, when you arrived on the 24th, uh, how many, approximately, how many other officers were there? Uh, including, like, deputy sheriffs, like in uniform? Yes, ma'am. Yes, oh, um, approximately four, maybe, I would assume. Had it been designated a crime scene at that time and had tape or security measures been taken to protect the scene? Yes, they had. So that had already been done by the time that you arrived. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, in the investigation, one of your, um, or what you're trying to accomplish in the investigation is basically get a basics of what took place. Would you agree with me there? Yes, I would. And you can do that one or two ways or, or a combination of ways. One is to take testimony of potential witnesses. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Uh, this day, did you, in fact, do that? Yes, I did. And one of those potential witnesses was uh, Sarah Boone. Is that correct? Yes, it was. And you took a statement from Sarah Boone because we've all seen it. Is that correct? Yes, we have. And at that point in time, uh, Ms. Boone did not have to talk to you if she didn't want to, did she? Did she? No, she did not. So she agreed to talk to you at that point in time? Yes, she did. Okay. Uh, were there any other witnesses besides Ms. Boone that you talked to on this initial day of the 24th? Just Brian Boone. And Mr. Boone told you what? Uh, you had a chance to talk to him. He told you his involvement. Is that correct? That's correct. And in fact, wasn't Mr. Boone's uh, testimony, was that recorded to you? I conducted an audio recording, yes. Okay. Uh, is that standard procedure when you do your interviews to try to record the interviews? Yes. What's the benefit of that? So I know what was said. Okay. So, and if something goes on for a long time, you can refer back to it. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. So, and I think that's part of talking to witnesses or potential witnesses. Okay. Also... Uh, it's your job, too, to identify potential physical evidence in a case. Yes, it is. And in fact, on the 24th, did you do that? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, did you have anyone assisting you in doing that aspect of it? Yes, crime scene investigators and digital forensics investigator. All right. And was uh, Ms. Melissa Rothengarten? Uh, is that how it's pronounced? Pronounce it for me. Rough Garden. Rough Garden. Okay, thank you. Uh, did she help you in that area? 
She was the lead uh, crime scene investigator, yes. So were y'all walking around together? Get, give the jury an idea of how that process takes place, please. Um, so yes, when I initially arrive on scene, um, I introduced myself to Sarah Boone and explained that I wished to go inside her residence, um, which gave me consent to go in and look around. Um, I went in, looked around, um, and then when my CSIs arrived, um, they, they would go in, take pictures, and then I kind of leave them to do what they need to do as far as taking pictures and documenting things and measurements. And then that's when I conducted my interviews. And then I would meet back up with my crime scene investigator after interviews were conducted um, to kind of follow up with like things that I was told that would help us like identify things from the scene. And so, I mean, there's like multiple occasions where I would have met with my crime scene investigator inside the residence. This is an ongoing process on that day. You get information, you consult with them, they have information, they consult with you, and you're making a determination of what potential physical evidence that y'all at least like to document by camera, correct, or, pictures, or actually collect and take away. Is that correct? Yes, so it's accurate. Uh, in that case, uh, the suitcase was uh, some evidence that y'all agreed on that we need to take this suitcase from the scene. Is that correct? Yes, it was. Okay. How about the baseball bat? Was that done that day? The baseball bat was collected, yes. In your viewing of the suitcase, did you see this, view the suitcase while it was on scene? Yes, I did. Did you notice that if there was any items, other independent loose items in the suitcase? There were, yes. Were those items collected? Some of them were, yes. Who made the determination what items of that suitcase would be taken or collected and what would not be collected? I would say that I have the final say on what is to be collected or not collected, um, but we do discuss it together um, to make that determination for me to give the final yes or no. Uh, do you recall which items you decided to collect from the suitcase? Do you have the property form that I can refer to? No, I'll try to find it. <laughs> I know some of them, but... Ma'am, I don't have it. But to the best of your memory, can you tell? And I would, I would understand there would be some stuff that if you had the property report to refresh your memory, you can give me more detail. Um, yes, to my understanding um, and to my recollection, uh, we collected things that had blood left over on it. I want to say there was like a necktie potentially. Um, I do recall there being a small amount of clothing and miscellaneous paperwork, but I do not think that we collected the paperwork. There was also a cell phone in there. It was dead. Like I said, there might be one. I, I think we collected five to six items from the suitcase itself, um, but obviously the the property form would tell you specifically. But that is what I recall. Correct, and I understand, and that's fair. Okay. Um, so potentially you you collect these items because you believe they're evidence for the case, potentially. Is that correct? Yes. And some of these items you actually collect with the potential that you might need to have them examined in greater detail. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, an example of something like that is, would be in this case, if you found blood on something, you might want to potentially examine that. Is that correct? Yes. The stuff that you, you learn, the information that you're getting or you're receiving about what happened at that time will lead you to determine what items might need to be collected and what items might need to be tested. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Out of the items that were collected at the house or the apartment, at those items, was anything, to your knowledge, sent off for further examination? I believe so, but if it was, there would be um, a... They would be sent to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for further testing. And do you have an independent memory of what items that were collected from the house that were sent to FDLE for further examination? I don't recall specifically without looking. Okay. At one point in time, there were some fingernail clippings or fingernail swabs 
uh, taken from Ms. Sarah Boone. Is that correct? Yes. In fact, that was done on her interview date on the, would it have been the 25th? Yes, sir. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and that's what we witnessed in the video. Yes. That's what they were doing at that time. Correct. And I'm sure at the autopsy, which you were present at, is that correct? Yes. And those, uh, there would have been some fingertip swabs of George Torrey. Were you familiar with that? They do swabbing of the hands, to my understanding, and um, clippings of his nails. Okay. Uh, do you uh, have an independent memory of the fact that Sarah Boone's uh, fingernail swabs were sent to FDLE for comparison? I would believe so. Okay. How about the ones from Mr. Torres? Do you have knowledge that those were sent to FDLE for comparison or identification? Well, they would have come from him, so I'm not sure what we would have compared them to. Okay. Uh, were they there to see, or at least they're sent there to see if they can extract uh, DNA? Oh, okay. Yes. I mean, I'm not sure if they did that testing for his nails clipping specifically, but it would be in the uh, report if so. Okay. Who would make the decision about sending his, his uh, finger swabs to FDLE for comparison or evaluation? Uh, I would request it from, or I would request it to the crime scene investigator, and she would, um, like, author the, I guess, like, procedure for them to do so. Okay. Then, as to Sarah Boone's swabbings, uh, who requested that those be sent to FDL A for evaluation? Again, I would assume that I would have done that. Um, I would have requested CSI to do that. Are you aware of the results from those evaluations? I'm not asking you for the results, just if you're aware of the results. I believe I'm aware, um, but would love to see a report for before I specifically answer. Yes, I'm not going to ask you a specific question. Oh, okay. But basically, you're aware that it was done, the procedure was done. Yes. So you're through the first day, then we get to the second day, which would have been, I believe, the 25th of February, is that correct? Yes. And on the 25th of February, was Mr. Torres's autopsy done at that time? Yes, it was. Were you present during the autopsy? Yes, I was. And... Did you communicate with the medical examiner at that time? Yes, I did. During the course of things, is that where you found out through the medical examination, examiner at the autopsy that there was uh, blunt force trauma injuries? Yes, that is where I learned about more about his injuries. Now, initially, when you were on the when you were on the scene on the twenty fourth, uh, did you view Mr. Torres's body? Yes, I did. Did you notice in and of yourself on your own something that caused you concern that there might be blunt force trauma injuries? Yes, I noticed injuries to him, yes. Okay. So after uh, the autopsy, you had additional information. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Now, there was an interview. Well, I don't know if it was an interview. There was a meeting set up for... Uh, Sarah Boone, is that correct? Yes. On the 25th? Is yep. that correct? Yes. Can you tell me how that meeting was arranged or how that meeting was set up, please? So either before I left the scene, um, the night of the incident, I obviously met with Sarah and told her that we were leaving. Um, we had to go make next of kid notification. And um, I would have either at that time said I would like to meet tomorrow um, and arranged it then, um, at least to like let her know that I would like to meet after the autopsy. And then, um, obviously, from watching the video towards the end, she said um, something about like recalling a conversation that we had, like calling me. Um, so there may have been a phone conversation that occurred later that evening um, where I either would have confirmed the time or told her the time then. I just 
don't have that like on an audio. Um, but I know it either took place before I left the scene because I obviously would have, you know, said my goodbyes and told her, Hey, we're leaving. We're going to make next of kid notification. She was very concerned about that. So I would want her to know, um, that we were doing that. Um, so it either took place then or it took place on that phone conversation that we had. All right. The day, the day prior to that, on the 24th, ma'am, uh, you received Sarah Boone's phone. Is that correct? Yes, her phone was on the scene, yes. And uh, when you received that phone, Sarah Boone had given you that phone. Is that correct? No, she was not allowed in the apartment to give me the phone. I'm sorry. Did she give you permission to take the phone? Yes. Okay. Is that correct? Yes, I was given permission to go through her phone, yes. Because at that time, you hadn't applied for any type of search warrant to get or search the phone. Is that correct? No, I, it was based off of consent. Okay. So she had consented to you to, uh, for you to have her phone. Yes. Is that correct? She also provided you the code to get in the phone. Is that correct? Yes. So at this point in time, Ms. Boone is cooperating with you, isn't that correct? Yes. Now, ma'am, do you recall telling her, Ms. Boone, that, you could, that she could get her phone back the next day? I don't recall specifically telling her when she would be able to get her phone back, but I did say something along the lines of um, we were now going to be taking the phone. I obviously had digital come out. Um, or consent to go through her phone. There was evidence on her phone that I needed to be downloaded. Um, and at the time, I was willing to give back her phone um, before going through it. And then once we had gone through it um, and those videos were found, I felt like this was very different. And it um, changed my perspective on consent. Um, and I decided at that time that it was best to write a search warrant. Um, so consent couldn't be basically like I knew I was going to take her phone. Um, so consent has to be basically given to me throughout the entire period. So she would have had no way to contact me to tell me she no longer consented. So therefore, um, because there was evidence on the phone, um, I took the phone. Basically, I potentially told her, you know, maybe we didn't get a full download. I may have said something along the lines of that. <laughs> as far as me taking the phone. Um, and then uh, I wrote a search warrant. Um, I either started writing the search warrant the night of, but it wasn't signed until, I didn't submit it until the next day. Um, and then it was signed the next day on the 25th. So basically what you're telling us is that she could have withdrawn her consent at any time prior to that search warrant being received, is that correct? Well, while I was on scene, but at the end of the day, there was evidence on the phone. So I knew I could go through the, I knew I could get a search warrant to go through the phone based off there being evidence, um, like the 911 calls, um, and her explaining to me that they had spoken to family members. Um, please silence your cell phones. Since they had explained to me that they, uh, spoke with, um, family members the night prior. So I wanted to obviously corroborate her statement. So I knew that I would be able to get into the phone through a search warrant. Um, but yes, yeah, she could have not consented and she could have not signed the paper consenting while we were on scene. But before you left scene, uh, you knew that Sarah Boone was not going to get that phone back. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So when Sarah Boone called you the next day, uh, asking you about bringing her phone back. Did you just tell her, Ms. Boone, you're not getting your phone back? There was not a conversation about her not getting her phone back. She may have inquired about her phone, um, and I would have explained that we will talk about it when we meet that afternoon. Did you reach out to Ms. Boone that next day, or did Ms. Boone reach out to you? I don't recall a specific if she reached out to me the night of the 24th or before the interview on the 25th, I don't have my call records um, for that. Um, I'm just basing it off of the interview where she had basically said that, yeah, I have your business card and I can contact you like I did. Um, so my assumption would be that we did have some sort of conversation either the night of the 24th or before the interview on the 25th. On the 25th, you make arrangements with Sarah Boone 
to meet with her on the 25th. So I either made arrangements on the 24th with her before leaving the scene, and I would have told her I would like to meet with you the next day, or I said, um, and I may have given her a specific time at that moment, or when we spoke later that evening um, on the phone, I may have confirmed the time or given her a time then. But she definitely knew that we were meeting at 3 p.m. on the 25th at Orange County Sheriff's Office Central Operations. And ma'am, you don't... You you just don't remember at what point in time you informed her or set up this meeting with her. Is that correct? It's one or the other that one I'm sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, as it to it being one or the other, you did the, uh, you prepared the investigative report in this case. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Uh, and, and the investigative report, you basically summarized everything that took place in, on this case up to a certain point. Yes, it was a summary, yes. As far as evidence, as far as witnesses who were talked to and synopsis of what they said to you at that time, is that correct? Yes, things that I did specifically. It was a summary of that. I found your investigative report to be in great detail because it helped me track this case from basically beginning to not to the end, but to the point where the report restop stops. And it seems like in your investigative report, you are very thorough about details. Is that correct? I was a detailed person, yes, thank you. Okay. So being the detailed person you are, and, well, and absolutely doing your law enforcement training, they tell you, they train you that your report should be very much in detail. Is that correct? Yes. Okay because you might have to refer back to them at a later time. Is that one of the reasons? Is that correct? Yes, and to prepare myself for depositions and trials. Okay, and just to give an accurate picture of what you did and uh, what took place and what people told you. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Being as thorough as you are with these contacts with people, I didn't see in the investigative report when the arrangement was made with Sarah Boone to meet you down, and where, I'm sorry, where did y'all meet? The Orange County Sheriff's Office Center Operations. To meet you at the Orange County Sheriff's Office. I did not see that in the report. Do you have an explanation why? It's not typically something I would put in my report. Okay. Do you remember in, in uh, having the conversation with... Um, Ms. Boone, about this meeting that was supposed to take place, uh, that uh, you said that you could not return the phone to her uh, that day because uh, you, were, you were not feeling very good. Remember telling her that? That never happened. That never uh, happened, did it, Homer? Ma'am, during this time frame, were you pregnant at this time, at that time? Yes, I was. All right. Well, anyway, uh, Miss Boone, there was a, a meeting arranged. Is that correct? For the 25th at 3 p.m., yes. Yes, and Miss Boone showed up for that meeting. She did. Yes. We saw. Okay. Uh, do you remember uh, Abraham Reno? <laughs> yes. Okay. Did you take his recorded statement? <laughs> yes, I did. At the time that you took Mr. Moreno's recorded statement, was there anyone else with you? My partner should have been with me, Detective Scott Lowe. Okay. Ma'am, as to who was with you, would it help uh, refresh your memory if you were to see your investigative report as to that interview? Your Honor, I would object. She hasn't said that she needs any aid in refreshing her memory. Objection sustained. Ma'am, was Detective Scott Lowen with you doing that interview? Yes, I believe so. Ma'am, do you have an independent memory of Detective Scott Lowen being with you at that interview? I believe my partner was with me on the interview. Yes, I typically wouldn't go and do some follow up without my partner being with me. Thank you very much. Now, ma'am, did that interview, what date did that interview take place on? 
I believe the 26th, February 26th of 2020. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, was that interview recorded? It was audio recorded. Was the entire interview audio recorded? Yes, the entire interview was audio recorded. Ma'am, are you familiar with a witness by the name of Brandon Motes? Yes, I am. On February the 27th of 2020, did you take an uh, interview Brandon Motes? I believe so. It was either the 26th or 27th, yes. If you were to see your investigative report, would that help refresh your memory? All right. So, again, the chair, she hasn't indicated that she needs assistance with her memory. No problem. Objection sustained. Ma'am, if it was the 27th, you would not disagree with that, would you? Well, I just stated that it was either the 26th or 27th. Okay. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, Mr. Motes, uh, he was the uh, neighbor living in the apartment or the connecting apartment, wall apartment, with uh, Ms. Boone and Mr. Torres. Is that correct? Yes. And he's the one who told you about the loud noise. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Did you interview anyone else in a room? reference to that loud noise. So I was interviewing Brandon and then my partner was interviewing Vincent, the other witness, and I came in at the end of the um, interview with Detective Lowen. Okay, so that's Vincent. Do you know his last name? I would butcher it. Uh, me too, but let's tag <laughs> Lowen. Something like that. We're yes. talking about the same person? Yes, sir. Okay. And did that interview take place on February the 27th of two, uh, 2020? I believe so. I interviewed witnesses after I interviewed Sarah. The 26th or 27th would be my memory. Okay, thank you. And then um, did he also talk to you about a loud noise? I believe that I was refreshed on the conversation, um, and yes, he ex he expressed hearing a loud noise as well. Okay, thank you. Now, and those those interviews were actually audio recorded too. Is that correct? Yes, they were. Okay. Now let's go to Miss Boone's interview, and that would have took place on the twenty fifth. Is that correct? Yes. Prior to Ms. Boone coming down for the interview, had y'all made the decision that Ms. Boone was going to be arrested? Yes, I plan to arrest Sarah Boone. Okay. Did you tell Ms. Boone in arranging the meeting that when she came down there, she was going to be arrested? Your Honor, I'm going to object this to relevance. Approach. Objections overruled. So, ma'am, at that time, you did not tell Ms. Boone prior to coming down there that she was going to be arrested. Is that correct? No, I did not. Okay. Why did you not tell Ms. Boone that she was going to be arrested? We planned to meet at 3 p.m. and go over the autopsy and have another interview. Um, so, I mean... I'm not sure why I would tell her that she's going to be arrested. That would potentially cause her to flee, um, you know, not come. And then we have to go find her and make it more difficult for everyone. Or potentially get an attorney to come with her. She has read her rights that said that she has a right to an attorney. Um, and if one cannot be provided for her, uh, she will be appointed one. I understand that. You read her those rights when she got there. Is that correct? Yes, I did. You didn't read those her those those rights to her before she got there, though, did she? I wasn't in contact with her, physical contact with her. Okay. So, but she, you said potentially for fleeing. My question was, potentially she could have got an attorney, too, to come with her. Is that not correct? I misunderstood your question. I didn't hear potentially bring an attorney with her, but yes, I guess she potentially brought an attorney with her. 
So Miss Bloom shows up and uh, you you tell her that some things that we need to talk about. Is that correct? It's specific verbiage. I know I said something along the lines of uh, obviously the autopsy had been conducted um, and there were things that we needed to like talk about in regards to that. Okay, but prior to discussing it with her and asking her questions, you did read her Miranda warnings. Is that correct? Yes, before I started asking any sort of incriminating, potentially incriminating questions, she was read her Miranda warnings, yes. Okay. Ma'am, do you remember as part of the Miranda warnings that you read to Ms. Boone, did you read her the one that states that if you decide to answer questions, uh, but want to stop answering and consult with an attorney, you may do so. Do you independently remember reading Miss Boone that instruction? I don't recall uh, that specific, but I do have my Miranda card on me, but I don't recall that that's what that says. But it is on audio and video recording. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Now, ma'am, at that point in time, Ms. Boone wasn't under arrest. Is that correct? Ms. Boone was not going to be free to leave once she was in my custody. At that point in time, had you told Ms. Boone that she was not free to leave? No, I did not. At that point in time, had you told Ms. Boone that she was under arrest? I told her at the end of the interview. Okay, before the interview. No, I did not tell her before the interview. Uh, Ma'am, why didn't you tell her before the interview? Your Honor, I'm going to object as to ask and answer. Overruled. So I have to read her her Miranda warnings, and that's what I did. I do not have to tell her that she's under arrest at that time. Could you have told her that she was under arrest before me reading her her Miranda warning? Your Honor, I'm going to object as it calls for speculation. Sustained. Ma'am, was it a strategic decision not to tell Ms. Boone that she was under arrest prior to reading her those Miranda warnings? Your Honor, I'm going to object this to relevance. Approach. Objection uh, sustained. Ma'am, and we were able to see the video of the interview. As a process of interviewing people such as Ms. Boone, or in the, well, let me specifically, in the process of interviewing Ms. Boone, uh, is law enforcement free to give information that might not be accurate or true during the interview process? Are you asking if we're allowed to lie to her? Yes. Yes, to an extent. Was that done at any time in this interview? Did I lie to her? I don't recall lying to her, no. Thank you, ma'am. I have no further questions. Any redirect examination? No, Your Honor. Can this witness be released? State. Uh, we have her subject to recall. Okay. Subject to recall. All right, ma'am, you're released subject to recall. Thank you. Great. Thank you. State, any other witnesses, evidence, or testimony to be produced? All right, this time state would rest. Okay. Members of the jury, it is 10.22 a.m. I have some matters with counsel that I need to address. So we're going to excuse you for a short while. It's a great opportunity for us to take our morning break as well. We'll bring you back in as promptly as possible. Thank you. Jury exiting. You all may be seated. Thank you. Do we have any motions? We do, Your Honor. You may proceed. Your Honor, this time the defense would move for a judgment acquittal. Uh, I'm going to start with just a real quick couple of comments, Your Honor. We know that JOA motions have come become essentially pro forma, uh, which may be why I've been assigned this responsibility today. But uh, in this instance, I want to make an argument that I think has some merit. I've been paying close attention uh, to the testimony in this case, uh, and I want to point a couple things out. First of all, we know that the court has essentially become, has assumed the role and is assigned the role of becoming a gatekeeper uh, in this matter. We know from the testimony that's been presented in this matter that not only did law enforcement, but also the Office of the State Attorney had knowledge of these parties uh, prior to the event having occurred. Uh, and despite that, 
uh, the state has proceeded with this prosecution based upon a criminal information as opposed to having taken it to the grand jury. Uh, that kind of places the court in a special position to evaluate the nature of the, the evidence that's been presented. I want to focus on the second degree murder uh, allegation. And one thing that occurred to me while watching the evidence as it was presented, watching the videos, particularly the interrogation, was part of the dialogue between Ms. Boone as well as Detective Scott Lowen at the end of the um, interrogation. And I'm going to paraphrase. I apologize. I should have written this down verbatim. I did not. But she's advised that she is being placed under arrest. Something to that effect. And her response is, why are you doing this? The detective's response to Ms. Boone is, because George is dead. I'm sorry? Thank because you. George is dead. That's not enough. Um, I think since she's the one who zipped him up, it's definitely enough. It's not enough to support a second degree murder, prosecution, conviction, or should, or should it even be enough to allow this matter to go to the jury? Now, there are three elements of the second degree murder uh, uh, information. The first is that the victim is dead, that Mr. Torres is dead. We stipulated to his identity. Uh, there has been no argument to the fact or the idea that he died in this incident. However, the state also has to show that it was caused by a criminal act and that the act was imminently dangerous and demonstrated a depraved mind. Oh, fuck you. Oh, fuck you. Oh, stupid. The fact that it was imminently dangerous, I think, is belied by the fact that Jorge Torres voluntarily entered the suitcase, uh, albeit under the influence of alcohol. Uh, but the perception of dangerousness, dangerousness that's attributable to the victim, apparently he did not perceive it to be a dangerous or imminently dangerous uh, situation in having entered the suitcase, uh, possibly because of the influence of alcohol on his capacity to make decisions, uh, should necessarily be attributed to the defendant as well. So Homer Simpson willingly walks into a steam room, then someone uses a wrench to trap him inside. Homer almost dies. That's attempted murder. What's so hard to understand about that? George got in the suitcase. Sarah trapped him inside by zipping it up. Then he suffocated. It's called murder. It's very simple. Order the steam gentile. Ooh, steam gentile. But I also want to focus on the depravity issue, which the state must prove. Uh, and pursuant to the jury instruction, this matter, depravity is equivalent or equivocated or equivocated is made of the equivalent of ill will, hatred, spite, or, or evil intent. Stupid. And that's not enough. Not only does the state have to show depravity, but it has to show, because it's in the conjunctive, uh, that the act demonstrates an indifference to human life. Fuck you. The state has presented testimony and argument in this matter, not argument, but uh, testimony that in fact George Torres was suffering. Suffering does not equal hatred. It does not equal ill will. God, I can't breathe, baby. That's on you. And even if they were to establish negligence, that's not homicidal. Uh, we know that suffering is something that the courts have been very, very cognizant of and very sensitive to. Uh, we know it from the field of capital punishment. Uh, and incarceration. The idea that somebody suffers is not in and of itself homicidal, nor should it support the idea that there was indifference to the life of George Torres by Sarah Boone. Was she angry? I think there's clear evidence that she was angry. But that's not hatred. And that's the element that has to be proven here. And I don't think that there is prima facie case of that in fact she was, that she demonstrated hatred so much as she demonstrated anger doesn't establish a prima facie case uh, of second degree murder. It's for those reasons, Your Honor, that I think that this matter should be uh, the motion for JOA as to second degree murder should be granted. Uh, and this matter should be allowed to proceed solely on a manslaughter charge uh, because, in fact, they have not established prima facie elements 
as reported by law. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Response. Yes, thank you. Standard this time is just a prima facie case. Whether uh, any trier of fact in taking all the facts uh, in the light most favorable to the state and the inferences drawn from them establish the elements of the crime. There are three elements to this crime. George Torres is dead has been established by a prima facie case. The death was caused by the criminal act of Sarah Boone that has been established. There was an unlawful killing of George Torres by an act imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind without regard for human life. An act is imminently dangerous to another and demonstrating a depraved mind if it is an act or series of acts that a person of ordinary judgment would know is reasonably certain to kill or do serious bodily injury to another. It's not Miss Boone's subjective statements on February 25th. I had no idea you could die from being zipped into a suitcase for uh, 13, 15 minutes before she goes to bed. Two, is done from ill will, hatred, spite, or an evil intent. We heard what she said. Uh, the two minute video starting at 11, 12 p.m., 45 seconds, would be linked in Merriam Webster's digital dictionary for the definition of depraved mind. Fuck you. I don't care. Laughing is of such a nature that the act itself indicates an indifference to human life. Sarah, that's my name. Don't wear it out. Judge, um, there's, there's no question that a prima facie case has been laid in addition to the two minute video and then the 22 uh, second video 11 minutes later. We also have the defendant's inconsistent statements uh, that she has made in regards to these events. And therefore, we have that factual issue for the jury to decide. She uh, made statements on the 911 call and to law enforcement, both on the 24th and 25th, that I have no idea what happened. Um, I just went to sleep. Everything was good. And then when confronted with her video um, on the 25th, uh, we, we see that there are two distinctly different sets of statements that were made. Um, so this is uh, sufficient at this stage in time for a jury question. Thank you. Thank you. Any other additional argument, Mr. Beck? Oh, thank you. Thank you both for your arguments. Uh, the court, in viewing the light most favorable to the state, court finds that the state has presented competent but rebuttal evidence to establish each of the elements of the charge contained in the information to the required level of a prima facie showing. As such, the defense's motion for a judgment of acquittal is denied. Denied! Defense, do you intend on putting on a case? Yes. Okay. Ms. Boone, I have a couple of questions to go over with you. Ma'am, I don't, again, don't want to go into any specifics of any conversations that you've had with any of your attorneys in this case. Mr. Owens has identified for the court his normal practice of calling a defendant last in a criminal case. In this case, he has advised that he wants to call you first. Without going into any discussions of any strategy that you've had with your attorneys, do you understand the strategy that Mr. Owens and your team will be utilizing your defense? Yes. And are you in agreement with that strategy? Yes. All right. So far, you've been present throughout the entire trial process. You've been seated at counsel's table. You have the opportunity to observe the evidence presented by the state, as well as the direct and cross-examination of the state's witnesses. Are you satisfied with your attorney up and until this point? Yes. Now, I'm similar, I'm going to ask you some questions, again, about specific conferences and conversations you have with your attorneys. I don't want to know those specifics, just whether or not those things have been had. Have you had the opportunity to discuss with your attorneys whether or not you would like to testify as a witness in this case? Yes. Do you any, need any additional time to discuss that matter with your attorneys? No. Have your attorneys discussed with you the potential benefits and potential harms of testifying as a witness in this case? Yes. Are you satisfied with the advice from your counsels? Yes. Do you understand that attorneys can make most of the decisions about trial strategy? They cannot determine whether or not a defendant testifies or not. Do you understand that? Yes. Not even the court can interfere with the defendant's right to make that decision. Do you understand that? Yes. Do you understand that it is your decision and your decision alone? Yes. While counsel can give you advice on whether or not it would be wise for you to testify in this case, do you understand that you can ignore counsel's advice because the final decision is yours? Yes. Do you understand that you have the right to remain silent? Yes. 
Did you hear me explain to the jury at the beginning of the trial how the right to remain silent is absolute, and the fact that a defendant did not testify cannot be considered as evidence of guilt or influence their verdict in any way? Before a jury begins its deliberations, the court will read another jury instruction if you decide not to testify. This instruction orders the jury not to consider your silence as evidence of guilt or to consider your decision at all. Would you like me to read that instruction for you at this time? Yes. It is instruction 3.9a entitled Defendant Not Testifying. The Constitution requires the state to prove its accusations against the defendant. It is not necessary for the defendant to disprove anything, nor is the defendant required to prove her innocence. It is up to the state to prove the defendant's guilt by evidence. The defendant exercised a fundamental right by choosing not to be a witness in this case. You must not view this as an admission of guilt or be influenced in any way by her decision. No juror should ever be concerned that a defendant did or did not take the witness stand to give testimony in the case. Do you have any questions about that, this instruction? No, Your Honor. And do you understand that if you choose to testify, you are waiving your right to remain silent? Yes. That means once you begin to answer questions, you have to answer all questions unless I instruct you not to answer a question. Do you understand that? Yes. You cannot pick and choose which questions you want to answer and not answer. Do you understand that? Yes. Do you understand that if you refuse to answer any questions, the court can impose sanctions, such as holding you in contempt, striking your entire testimony, and instructing the jury not to consider any of your testimony. Do you understand that? Yes. If you choose to testify, you will also be subject to cross-examination and impeachment. That means the state could ask you about any prior felony convictions or convictions for crimes of dishonesty if you have any such convictions. If you have any such convictions, the questions will be limited to whether you have such convictions and the number of same. Do you understand that? Yes. Are you aware if you have any such convictions? Yes. State, are you aware of any felony convictions or convictions for crimes of dishonesty? No, I believe she's answering them firm. She's aware that she doesn't. Okay, so you have no such convictions. Okay, thank you for that clarification, ma'am. As there are no convictions, and that number is not in dispute, the state will not be permitted to inquire into those matters. Have you had enough time to discuss your decision to testify or not testify with your attorneys? Yes. Again, do you need any additional time? No. Has anyone forced you, threatened you, to get you to testify or not testify in this case? No. Has anyone made any promises to you to get you to testify or not testify in this case? No. Are you satisfied with your counsel's advice so far in this case? Yes. Are you making this decision freely and voluntarily? I am. Did anyone force you, threaten you, or coerce you to testify in this case? No. Would you like to testify or not testify as a witness in this case? Testify. Okay. And ma'am, similarly, after you've had the opportunity to converse with your lawyers Again, I want to confirm that you're on board with the strategy that they've utilized in your defense in this case. Yes, I understand. Including calling you first. Yes. Okay. All right. I want to remind you, ma'am, that you can change your mind. You just have to let your lawyers know before the jury comes back in. Do you understand? Yes. State, anything else we need to address? Just that the law of the case is that there should be testimony from uh, the defendant of an overt act that particular day before there is testimony about reputation evidence, prior incidents of violence, or any of the ancillary things that come in self-defense. The Holland case speaks for itself. Anything further? I do want to talk about that, but as it relates to uh, her right to remain silent or testify, I have nothing about that. Okay. Then what do we need to address with regard to Holland? Well, I've got three issues. One is Holland. The other is I've got these gloves. <clears throat> My client and I would like to take a few moments to look at the suitcase and to look at that. And then the third thing is uh, that the state had filed that motion for the in-camera hearing. I don't, I don't know, but maybe we need to hear that before she testifies. The court's not going to address that at this time. Okay. We'll address that later okay. in the proceedings. So the two things, number one, um, of course, I've got a lot of photographs about the prior violence that George Torres 
committed on Sarah Boone, and there is a dispute about whether or not I have to establish an overt act that she responded to, that she considered an imminent threat, and that she took evidence or she took action to either block or physically restrain George Torres from committing an act of violence on her. But, Judge, if you'll remember, during the two-hour interrogation, the officers make mention that they are aware of the prior incidences of violence. So I, I believe the door has been open that I can go into that based on that those statements by the two detectives. Uh, if you if you remember, she, they introduced this two-hour video. She says, he comes at me all the time. I think eventually uh, Sarah Boone realized that they had her phone and they were going to see pictures. They were going to see videotapes of evidence that George Torres committed acts of violence on Sarah Boone. I think at that point she changed her tone about George. She was trying to protect George, but then she realized she would have to disclose uh, some of the acts that had been committed on her by George Torres. And so she did talk about him coming at me, and, and we've had issues before. And the officers gave, I can't remember exactly what they said, but yeah, we're well aware of I don't, I don't know if they said the prior acts or were aware of the domestic violence, whatever the case may be. I submit that opens the door. That was during their case in chief. They chose to play that entire video. And so I think I can talk about the prior bad acts um, before the event in question chronologically. And I've got, of course, I've got a bunch of photographs that uh, go into physical evidence of her injuries as a result of George's George's violence. Okay. Response, if any. Judge, we're asking for the court to maintain its ruling. Um, we already read an instruction that the police are allowed to tell her things to try and get reactions from her. They affirmatively denied there was no word act that night to the police. Um, and the court in its ruling pre-trial, I'm trying to get some guidance on this, reviewed Ms. Boone's most recent statements on the matter, and there is no overt act thus testified to. So we are hopeful that we will maintain that ruling. And I don't know how it prejudices her or her team in any way to establish an overt act on February 23rd, 2020, before we go into reputation evidence, prior instances of violence or matters of house in Any other further argument, Mr. Owens? All right. I don't find that the officer's statements are character evidence, and you're looking for specific instances of conduct which are going to be utilized for those specific purposes for reputation or uh, violence to establish the fear component that, that the case law speaks a lot about. Floor Supreme Court decision in Holland is clear that that overt act needs to be established before any of that evidence is submitted. I don't find that it's an opening of the door, and I'm going to rely on what the Floor Supreme Court has told us to do. Denied! Judge, uh, I've, got, I've got to get the clerk to mark some photographs, and then my client and I need to... Um, take that suitcase out of that box and inspect it, play with the zipper a little bit, and then also take that uh, bat out of that paper bag and inspect it uh, before she testifies. Any response? I'm just confused why we haven't utilized the nearly half an hour or more than the court has been off the bench to get these photographs marked. Um, the defense team has been on board for quite some time they did not request a second evidence view of the physical evidence that Ms. Boone already had an opportunity to view while she was pro se. It's 11.25. We need to we need to try the case. George, I think that she, she had that evidence view, I think, with Billy Lane. I believe that was the day after I filed my notice of appearance, or maybe it was the day I filed my notice of appearance. I don't remember exactly, but it had already been previously scheduled. I was in Milton, uh, so they went ahead and did it that morning, at, I believe, at the jail. I believe the evidence. Any particular reason why it hasn't been done in the last 45 minutes? Because I've When been, I sent my juror out, my jury out? I've been meeting with my client about okay. her rights to testify or not, and... Uh, other related matters. So um, in terms of not giving her this evidence? In terms of anything that the state just discussed? I've, I've just been busy with, with my client. Okay. How much time do you need in order to pre-mark these exhibits and look at the baseball bat and the suitcase, which have been entered into evidence? I would think uh, 15 minutes. 
I'm very concerned because it is 1125 and I discharged our jury some time ago and I don't want to be in a position where we have to break in the middle of testimony. May I suggest that we just take an early lunch? It's 1130. Let's take an early lunch. We've got witnesses coming this afternoon anyway. Uh, if, if her testimony ends before five, we've got one or two witnesses that are here. And then I believe tomorrow is Wednesday. We've got Dr. Brannon. It's going to be here first thing Wednesday morning, and then I believe Dr. Harper is not going to be here till Thursday morning. Uh, so I don't. We're going to have a little gap in time unless we can. We've got to put on several officers about prior acts and all that. But uh, I think for purposes of this, Judge, in the abundance of caution, I feel like I need to go over this this evidence with my client uh, before she testifies and. Um, I have not had a chance to view that evidence other than seeing it here today. But uh, I, I think I need to do that with her before she does. OK, can the parties approach for a moment? <clears throat> Councils have matters that they need to address with Madam Clerk for the pre-marking of exhibits and along with the review of the suitcase and bat, which were previously entered into evidence. I'm going to bring our based on the agreement of the parties. I'm going to bring our jury panel in at this time, release them for lunch. Give them a similar instruction to the instructions they've been provided earlier, and we will commence promptly at 1 o'clock this afternoon. State, any disagreement with the battle plan so far? Yes, sir. Same question, Mr. Owens. Yes, sir. All right, let's go ahead and stand, Brett. Bring, bring it back in our panel. I think you all can be seated. Thank you for your patience. Matters with counsel took a little bit longer than we anticipated. We're going to take an earlier break today. It's 11.35. Uh, we anticipate the defense putting on a case this afternoon, and we don't want to get into it and then have to break a half an hour into it. So we're going to go ahead and take that break at this time. With that, members of the jury, I thank you for your time and your service and your attentiveness, and we'll see you at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you. Jury, Ms. Boone is seated at counsel's table wearing the same black jacket and blue blouse from this morning. Um, we will be standing when our jury enters. She is in custody but out of any restraints. As she is testifying first, once we bring in our jury, she will walk to the jury box and be sworn in in front of the jury. State, are we ready to bring in our panel? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I was able to get the redactions done. I put a disc on Mr. Owens' notebook there. has the case number on it and three black dots and Sharpie. Just a, a random way of saying what it is. Excellent. Appreciate it. Thank you for getting that done uh, over the lunch hour. Defense, are we ready to bring, our, bring in our jury? I've got a couple of issues. Yes. Number one, Kevin Beck is uh, working on... Let the record reflect that Mr. Beck has appeared. For the record, I'd like to make two points about uh, this issue, about whether or not I can bring in evidence of prior acts, prior bad acts, prior to the overt act. And there's two reasons that I believe I should be allowed to do so. One is, Judge, in that two-minute video, Sarah Boone makes a statement, that's how I feel when you choke me. And then some, some moments later, that's how I feel when you cheat on me. And she's angry at him, and she's talking to him. She's talking to him in an intoxicated state, and she's expressing her anger and why she is angry. And I ought to be able to elaborate on what that is that she's angry about as it relates to when you choke me. That's my first motion. Okay. The before second proceed, one is, Judge, on this... we proceed with the second, is the second intertwined with the first? No. I, I mean, it's, it's a similar argument, but related to something else. Okay. Response. Judge, I don't disagree that they should be able to bring that in once they've established an overt act that is uh, imminently dangerous to an objectively reasonable person. I think that's the law on the law. Any other further arguments, sir? Not on that issue. Motion's denied. denied. Court again is going to rely on the Supreme Court's guidance in these situations based on Holland 916 Southern 2nd 750 at point point 760 through 761. My second argument ties into what he just said about what a reasonable person would do uh, under the circumstances facing an imminent threat, whether a reasonable person would perceive the, the overt act on the part of George Torres that was witnessed by Sarah Boone, would that be perceived by someone as a, as a imminent threat? And 
to some degree, you have to understand the history of George Torres and Sarah Boone. They were together three and a half years. They were engaged, but there had been a history of violence. And from the evidence that's been presented facing the, the circumstances in total, if you take what she said at various times, you would understand that she became concerned when he came back from Publix with that second bottle of wine because she knew when George Torres gets to a certain level of intoxication, he gets sad, he gets moody, and eventually he gets belligerent, and sometimes he can be violent. So she knew when he brought home that second bottle of wine that it was not going to be a good night, and she tried to keep him occupied and tried to keep his mind off of his troubles because she knew that if he reaches a certain level and is dwelling on his hardships, that he will react to her in a violent way. So she had that state of mind with that understanding of her history and his history in his overt act which she's going to testify to, coupled with the fact of her state of mind based on the, her past experiences with him in that intoxicated state and the fact that he is violent. So she was hypersensitive to danger and fear. And I think that ought to be allowed in as part of her collectively an overt act. So it was culminated by his state of intoxication coupled with his overt act created the well-founded fear for her to block the attack, to self-restrain or physically restrain George Torres in the suitcase, to actually use the bat to prevent him from getting out of the suitcase because she knew she was going to get attacked. And the, the basis of the opinion of about to be attacked is predicated on the prior incidences of violence, correct? Based on well, there's an art act committed by George Torres, but she was heightened because she knows when he gets to that <laughs> level of intoxication in that scenario, and that's an issue. So I need, I need clarification. What is it that you're asking me to do? For me to be able to elicit from Sarah Boone that she was concerned once that second bottle was brought, and that that's why she tried to placate him over the course of the evening, and that's why she had a heightened sense, or uh, heightened sense that he was capable, Judge, due to that, to, due to his degree of intoxication, that he may act violently towards her. And the problem is, a lot of the problem is, Judge, he doesn't remember battering her the next day. That's part of the reason that she videotapes him and photographs him. She starts to document what happens so that she can show him. She loves the man. She adores the man. She wants to marry him. She wants a life with him. But she's tired of being beat on. And so that all ties in to her behavior, uh, her sense of nervousness uh, at that point. The reason she was so confident during that two-minute video is because she knew, okay, this is my chance. He can't get to me. I can tell him exactly what he does that bothers me, that hurts me, and how I feel. And so that's all tied together with then he, struck, he starts to try to get out of the suitcase, and she reacts the way she does. Response. We held these arguments already. The court has ruled. There are no new arguments being made. Court understands exactly what Sarah Boone, the defendant, said to Dr. Werner on October 2nd. The court knows exactly what the defendant said to Dr. Harper over the period of a number of months and years. And there was no overt act. Um, the overt act has to be something that is objectively reasonable to cause a reasonable person to believe there's an imminent fear of great bodily harm or death. What the testimony is, is not um, that that's what has occurred. That there's, Her new testimony is this generalized fear, but you've already read that and you've already ruled on that. And I'll just remind the court that her previous testimony is, it's all fun and games, we're laughing, I zipped the suitcase shut, we're still both laughing, it's funny. And then the decedent says, I can't breathe. And then she flips a switch 
gets angry because it reminds her of all the times before where she is asserting that the decedent made her feel like she couldn't breathe. And then that's when she starts beating and shuffling the suitcase so much that it flips over and hitting him with a bat. We've covered this ground. Aggravated assault, aggravated battery, two independent forcible felonies. She's committing false imprisonment. She is the initial aggressor after there being no overt act. She can't start it and then say, well, I'm in fear of retaliation because that's what her testimony was is once I started doing these things, once I wouldn't let him out of the suitcase, I was afraid he would come out and harm me or kill me. Well, judge, if I pull a gun on you and I say, give me everything you own on you right now, and then you in turn pull a gun on me and say, bam, 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 and shoot and kill me. And I shoot, uh, let me strike that. You pull a gun on me to defend yourself, and then I shoot and kill you. I can't assert self-defense. I can't say, well, Judge Cranick pulled a gun on me and I was in fear of death because I, I was the initial aggressor. I was committing a forcible felony. That's the facts of these, this case here, according to her previous testimony. And the state concedes if she wants to change her testimony again, that's one thing. And then we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But if she testifies as she previously has, the court has already ruled there's no overt act, and you've read the transcripts. You know what she has said. Judge, she hasn't said it. She hasn't testified. Dr. Harper's testified. Dr. Warner's testified. They have not testified. They've given depositions. Well, given depositions, but she hasn't testified about the, the act in question. She hasn't testified about the end, event in question. She had consultations and, and evaluations by Dr. Harper where they had discussions that Dr. Harper could relate in her testimony. Dr. Warner can say what was said during the evaluation. Again, both of those were not reported. There, there may be disputes. I disagree with his characterization of that assessment. But it's up to Sarah to tell the truth here today. She's under oath. She's under oath today. She's got an obligation to tell the truth. If he thinks she's made prior inconsistent statements, it's up to him to impeach her with those inconsistent statements. To the extent that you are requesting permission to go into presumably and seemingly prior bad acts, vis-a-vis, -vis. he got the wine, and I know what happens when he gets it, and everything that follows from that. Those are bad acts. That is character. And the Florida Supreme Court has provided guidance and circumstances, specifically in Holland, on what needs to be done. You're attempting to provide information that the defendant was apprehensive of the victim at the time of the homicide, by virtue of the wine, et cetera, as you've proffered. That's bad character evidence that you're going to be bringing in. Historic bad character evidence. This is what happens when he drinks. This is what happens when I don't placate him. This is the situation that I find myself in, which inevitably may dovetail into prior incidents of abuse. That's all prohibited character under 404, 9404. And the carve out for that is if a overt act is established. It's not a subjective standard. It's an objective standard. The jury instruction, 3.6F, identifies it being an objective standard, and the Akendo case specifically tells us that it's an objective standard. In Akendo, the second DCA in 2023 stated, the conduct of a person acting in self-defense is measured by an objective standard, but the standard must be applied to the facts and circumstances as they appeared at the time of the altercation to the one acting in self-defense. I'm going to rely on Holland. Holland is the law of the land. It is what the Supreme Court has told us to utilize. That's what I will be relying on. The overt act has to be established. Denied! Listen, do you understand that? I do. Okay. Anything else? We cannot talk about any prior bad acts or anything of that nature until we talk about the actual event, the attack. Correct? Mm -hmm. You understand? Do you understand that? Yeah. Okay. Anything else, State? Nothing. Defense, anything else, sir? All right, let's go ahead and stand and bring in our jury. All right, thank you. Y'all can be seated. With that, state has rested. The defense is going to put on a case. Defense, Mr. Owens, you can call your first witness. Defense would call Sarah Boone. We've waited so long. I've got two tickets to paradise. Won't you pack your bags? We'll leave tonight. I've got two Please be square or her. That's the one you should give. Shall we prove the truth of what we got? I do. 
Hi, ma'am. You could take a seat. And if you could, state and spell your name for the record for us. Sarah Boone, 101077. And could you spell your name? S-A-R-A-H-B-O-O-N-E. All right, thank you very much. Sir, you may inquire. Ms. Boone, would you please uh, tell the jury where you were born and raised? Atlanta, Georgia. You were born in Atlanta? Born in Atlanta. And how long did you stay in Atlanta before you moved here to Florida? I was three years old, three or four. Okay. And um, from that time, y'all moved, you and your family, your mother and father, moved to Orlando? And my grandparents. Okay. Y'all all moved down from Atlanta down to Orlando? Yes, my two brothers. Okay. And uh, did you, were you raised here essentially from that time on? Yes. And you've resided here in Orange County, Florida that entire time? Yes. Okay. And uh, where did, did you go to high school here locally? I did. Where did you go to high school? Edgewater. Okay. And tell the jury, uh, how old were you when you graduated? I was 18 years old. Now, I know you lost your mother and father. Um, Overruled. I know you lost your mother and father in your teens and in your 20s. Is that true? I lost my grandfather when I was a sophomore in high school, and I lost my father when I was a senior. And then uh, my mother passed away a few years after that, and then my grandmother passed away after my mother died. All right, so you were in your 20s when all that was going on? Yes. Okay. And then at some point in your 20s, you met uh, Brian Boone? I did, yes. All right. And did uh, how long did y'all okay. date before you married? A good handful of years, my I helped my family with paying mortgage and bills for the house since my father had passed away and my grandfather. So, um, so you worked outside the home. I did. Okay. Can you tell the jury when you said you and Brian Boone um, dated for a while? Do you remember uh, when y'all married? I do. Could you tell the jury when y'all were married? The year. Yeah. Um. Do you remember the date? It happened to be, yes, that after my mother passed away, that he had waited to ask me to marry him because he knew it would be, um, I would. Objection, non-responsive. Sustained. Just, just answer the question if you can, Ms. Boone. Are you, are you a little bit nervous? A little bit. Okay. Well, just, just tell the jury if you remember the date that you and Brian Boone married. August 21st, 2004. Okay. And had y'all lived with each other for a little, a short time before that? Short time. Yes. Okay, after you married, how long was it before y'all had any children? Um, gosh, six years. Okay. And y'all y'all have one son? Yes. What's his name? Lucas. And how old is Lucas now? Lucas will be 14 years old on the 28th. 28th of this month? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you and Brian um, were married, and y'all lived in Orange County. How long were y'all married? 13 years. All right, and y'all divorced? Yes. And as part of the divorce, were y'all to share custody of your son? Yes. And so y'all would split days, would that be fair to say? Yes. Okay. At some time after you and Brian split up, did you meet uh, George Torres? Yes. All right, could you tell the jury how you met George Torres? Um, I met George when I decided to buck up, I guess, and was tired of trying to patch things up with my ex-husband. And I decided to go one day for a walk across the street and go have a beer by myself and sit and people watch just to get out of my house and a change of scenery. All right. Now, this is, is this your apartment? No, this is the marital home. Okay. Where is that marital home? Winter Park. You're no longer living in that marital home? No. Who lives in the marital home? Um, no one. It has been sold. Okay. So this, you met George Torres before you got the apartment? Yes. Okay. And you met him at a bar across the street from the marital home? Yes, we had a mutual friend there. Were you introduced? Yes. All right. How did you and George um, get along when y'all first met? Um, very well. It was... Um, it was strange how quickly we hit things off and had so much in common and, um, 
I never thought that he would be interested in someone like me. And I just couldn't believe that he was actually interested in me and said a lot of nice things. And um, one hour ended up being four hours um, from when we had first met. And then we would always have something to talk about. Why, why couldn't you believe that he would be interested in you? Um, he was very handsome. Um, he was very funny. Um, he was smart. And I would show up in workout clothes and disheveled hair. And I guess I kind of felt broken from being in the process of the divorce that he knew about. But then one of the things that we could relate also was the fact that he was here in Florida because he had just been divorced from his second wife. So that was another um, topic that he and I could compare notes on. So eventually the divorce was settled. Did you get your own place? Yes. Is it fair to say that after you, at first you lived in your, your parents' home, correct? Yes, until I was married. And then you moved directly in with Brian. Yes. And then y'all lived in the marital home, correct? Yes. And then you got this apartment. Yes. So that was the first time in your life that you actually had your own place. Yes. And what was the address? 4748 France Court, apartment number three. And what city is that in? It's in Winter Park. How far is that from here? 20 minutes. Okay. So you got that apartment and uh, initially were you by yourself? Um, no. All right, tell, tell the jury. Um, in the almost year, well, 10 months of separation from Brian, my ex-husband, that is the time when I met uh, George and my ex-husband was trying to buy me out or force me out of our marital home and I needed to find somewhere to live. And um, so did you did you and George agree to rent the apartment? Yes. One of the I needed extra income. We could not afford it uh, just on my own. You were receiving some income from the, the marriage settlement, were you not? Yes. So you, you did have a consistent monthly income coming in from the uh, settlement, marriage settlement? For the most part, yes. But you needed, you needed more to, to uh, live? Yes, to pay the bills and for rent. So did you and George have some agreement? We did. All right, what was the agreement? The agreement was that if I decided um, for he and I to live with one another, because it would be under my name, that he would help with the monthly bills and on a regular basis where it wouldn't be something that I would have to argue with him about. It would just be an automatic, um, make sure that everything's paid first. And then from there, hopefully have some fun with it. Okay. So I understand from that point on, um, would it be fair to say that y'all saw each other on and off for about the next three and a half years? No, um, we were, I, I would consider us a couple. Okay. At some point, he asked me to marry him. Okay. But y'all y'all did have times where he left and went to live with his parents. Yes. Is that, is that fair? Yes. And there were times where uh, there was an understanding that y'all were going to break up? Multiple times. Okay. All right. So, again, on again, off again. Yes, this was actually before we had our um, uh, apartment. That was, I guess, our dating phase. Okay. So y'all were together for three and a half years. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yes. And y'all had actually agreed to marry? He had asked me yes um, a couple of times to marry him, and one time I agreed to yes. Okay. Now, I want to get directly to the date of this event so that the jury can hear your testimony. All right. So tell us, I believe the date is February the 23rd of 2020. Explain to the jury that whole day from the time y'all got up, the whole thing. Approach. Objections overruled for now. Now, Ms. Boone, let's just, instead of one long speech, let me break you up over the course of the day. So do you remember the date of February 23rd, 2020? Yes. Do you remember getting up? Yes. All right. Just tell the jury about that morning. 
what y'all did that morning, what you and George, George, you and George spent the night together at, at the apartment. Yes, at that point he was living there. Yes. So y'all slept in the bed together upstairs February. So you got, you would have gotten up, y'all would have gotten up that morning, February 23rd of 2020. Yes. All right. Tell the jury what happened when y'all got up. Um, he was already downstairs and I went downstairs and he wanted to start the day off by drinking because it was a day off from his job. And I talked him into cleaning and tidying up the house for a sense of accomplishment. Um, so that is what we did, um, for however long that it took. Um, so we did tidy up the house and got everything in order and... It was kind of a reward, I guess, to be able to sit and enjoy ourselves and um, sit on the back porch. All right. What do you mean by cleaning up the house? What did y'all do? Um, we swept and mopped. We folded some of the laundry. Um, I know that we did the dishes, um, emptied the dishwasher, just general run-of-the-mill tidying up. And did you have your son coming the next day? Yes, that was one of the reasons why we, we were able to do that. What was the arrangement you had in terms of the next day would have been your day to pick up your son from school? Yes. What time would you pick Lucas up from school the next day? I believe his school ended at 3 o'clock. Okay. So you would have been responsible to pick him up and he would be spending a night with you that night? Yes. So you wanted to have the house nice and clean? Yes. How many bedrooms are in the home? Two. And uh, you and George had one bedroom? Yes. And who had the other? Lucas. All right. Is that exclusively his bedroom? Yes. All right. So how long would it have taken you all that morning to clean? Um, I don't really remember what time we woke up, um, but maybe a good two, maybe three hours. Okay. And would it be fair to say that you and George both smoked cigarettes? Yes. And would it be fair to say that you and George both drink alcohol? Yes. All right. So at some point, you all finished your chores, right? And then y'all were going to enjoy the day. Yes. All right. What was the plan? Um, it was just kind of, you know, we've got the day to ourselves. It's just kind of relax and go with the flow. Were y'all, did y'all make a decision that y'all were going to start drinking? Um, yes, he, we had a, a half of a bottle that was already in the refrigerator and I did not want to go out afterwards. I, again, had Lucas coming the next day. So we went over to Publix to purchase another bottle of wine um, so we could um, not have to go out later on that evening. Now, you, you were here in court when the state, the state played the video of you two and the Publix purchasing the bottle of wine? Yes. Is that what you're referring to here with the jury right now? Yes. Okay. And that was around noonish. I believe so. Yes. Okay. Had y'all started drinking the the leftover bottle yes. before before going to the public? No. Okay. So y'all bought a bottle of wine. Yes. All right. And how did y'all get to Publix? My car. How far is Publix from your apartment? Five minutes. How would you get there from your apartment? What do you mean? Did you have to go? cross any major highways or is it right there? Um, you just come out of our um, apartment complex and you do a little U-turn and then you come up and it's right in that complex. Okay. But it's easier to drive than to walk? Yes. Okay. Now I know that sometimes y'all would, would simply need cigarettes and it was mm -hmm. in walking distance. Can you tell the jury about that? Yes. Um, there was a Auto Zone convenience store with um, in the same, I guess, parking lot of our townhome, our complex, and it was just a straight shot from our um, apartment to a back gate, and you could get right into the convenience store from right there. Okay. But y'all went over to get that bottle of wine around noonish, and how did y'all, y'all, you took your car? Yes. Did George have a vehicle? He did not. And uh, how did you pay for the wine? With my debit card. And then y'all came back and started drinking? Yes. Okay. Tell us what you did when you got back from the Publix. Um, just went on the back porch where we, um, usually spend our time because we're able to smoke cigarettes outside as opposed to inside. And... Is cigarette smoking not allowed indoors? It is not. Okay. Do you have pets? 
Yes, I did. Well, did you, did you have pets? I did, yes. Okay. Um, were they with y'all there that day? Yes, my dogs were with me all the time when I was there. How many dogs do you have? I have two. And uh, just what are their names? Penny and Tess. And what, what is the breed? Um, they are red Boston Terriers. And are they both disabled? Um, yes, Penny is blind and Tef is deaf. So when y'all went out to smoke on the back porch and drink, I assume, as well, correct? Yes. Um, do y'all take the dogs out? Oh, yes. Right. Um, is there a place for them to do their business out there? Um, yes, I extended our back porch um, for them to have a little bit of area as opposed to going from a large back yard from my marital home to our little town home. And um, they would come out there and do their business and I could sometimes open, I would open the gate and then walk them in the back part of our um, apartment. So you and George were just gonna enjoy the day together? Correct. Is it fair to say y'all have a lot of money? Yes. And so y'all were gonna do something there in the home. Y'all weren't going out for dinner or Yes, we primarily, I would consider us homebodies as opposed to going out and partying and doing this and that. Okay. And how long do you think y'all were out uh, that afternoon outside? Um, a few hours. All right. Could you tell the jury what y'all did during that time? Um, we have a dartboard that's out there, and we just had drinks and... We're uh, just really enjoying each other's company and talking about, you know, things upcoming. You know, um, we both were looking for a job and just kind of, I guess, encouraging and supporting and planning. Well, now you said he had a job. Was he looking for a job, a second job? No, the job that he had was very unstable. And at that... So he was looking for something new? Yes, at that time, yes. Okay. And so... During that two or three hours, would it be fair to say that y'all drank the bottle? Yes. Okay. So would it be fair to say that y'all were feeling the effects of the alcohol? Yes. Okay. At some point, who made the decision to come in? I did. Okay. Why, why, did, y'all, why did you want to come in? I felt that George needed a change of scenery. Okay. So y'all came in, and then um, did y'all do anything else before he left again? Were y'all doing anything? I know y'all, y'all did some arts and crafts. What did, what did y'all do? At some point, he went to get another bottle at Publix. Yes. Um, after, I believe it was after we had, it was right before, I believe, that we had gone inside. Because um, uh, he called his daughters. I was trying to encourage him to call his family. Okay, now where, where are his daughters? Um, his two daughters are located in Pennsylvania. And what are their names? Anna and Destiny. And how old are they? I believe that Anna is in her 30s and um, Destiny may be in her early 20s. All right. Does he have any more children? Yes, he has a son. And what is his son? He is in Pennsylvania also. Okay. So part of that afternoon is y'all came in to call relatives, call family. No, I had him call outside, um, just trying to, I guess, boost the mood. Um, and uh, the first daughter didn't answer, and I don't remember the reason I didn't speak to the second one. It, I believe he, he did. It was just for a moment. All right. Now, whose phone are we are using? My phone. All right. And is that common for y'all to use that, for y'all to share that phone? It was because George said that he didn't have a phone, so uh, it would either be lost or um, given to him by his mother. Uh, so I didn't know he had a cell phone, so he would use my phone. So it was primarily your phone? Yes. Okay. And um, you took a lot of photographs that were on that phone? Yes. Videotapes? Yes. Text messages? Yes. Phone call? It's he and I both on the phone calls. So- he would use it as well. Yes. And uh, that phone, is that the one that was that was seized in this case? Yes. All right, so y'all called his daughters, 
And then um, during that phone call period, did you also call his brother? Yes. Okay. And who, which brother was that? John. Or now, how many, how many brothers and sisters does George have? Um, I'm going to list them at that beginning. Okay. Um, it's John, Burrell, Isaac, Mo, and his sister. Okay. And do they all live here in Florida? Yes. Are they close by? As far as I know, yes. What about his parents? Yes. They live here as well? Yes. Okay. But his ex-wives and his children live up in Philadelphia? Philadelphia? Uh, yes. Okay. So you called, called the girls, then you called, uh, or George called his brother? Yes. Was that conversation that long? No, it was not. Okay. And then after that phone call, uh, what did y'all, were y'all inside by this time? Yes, at this, at this point, I believe that it was a good time to get a change of scenery. So I thought George would be better off inside, and frankly, I didn't want to be outside any longer either. Okay. So just to get an idea, about this time is when he went to get the second bottle, or did y'all stay inside for a while before he left? No, um, from what I recall, it was, I thought the day was over, and it was going to be... Um, get ready for the evening, for the day, What maybe what do you want for dinner, you know, do you have an extra load of laundry that you need to throw in, kind of thing, and that was my understanding, and... This, said, was, this was about five-ish or something? I don't remember the time. Okay. At some point during that time period, did George go to Publix again? Yes, I thought he was going to be walking to the convenience store, but apparently um, when he returned... He had gone across the street with my car and my debit card to buy another bottle of wine. What was your understanding of where he was going? To the convenience store, walking. For what? Cigarettes. And you've learned, you learned obviously, that he came back and you, you learned that he'd used your vehicle? Yes. And he'd used your debit card? Yes. And he'd brought back a bottle of wine from Publix? Right. And you saw the, uh, the Publix video of that? Yes. So he comes back with the other bottle of wine, and did he want you to drink with him? It was expected, yes. Yes. And you, know, you agreed to consume the wine, the second bottle with him? Yes. Okay. So over the course of that evening, drinking the wine, did what did y'all do for time-wise? Uh, watch a movie, music, just kind of tell the jury what you remember. I know it's obviously been a while, but... Um, it was kind of a regular thing where um, I would always try to come up with um, entertaining activities for George. And um, for, um, I bought a, a puzzle. Um, we started off uh, at one point doing a smaller puzzle, and then we did that very quickly. So then I purchased a larger puzzle, and I believe it was a 1,000 pieces. So I thought to get his mind off of things and to focus on something, um, it would be smart for us to do the puzzle. So for however long that took, um, we finished the puzzle. So that was one. Did you, did you, every piece was finished or was it? Um, every piece was finished. It was strange that we couldn't find one piece and we thought it was funny that um, it was like in like the perfect place on there. But yes, every, every one but one piece. All right, after the puzzle, what did, what did y'all do? Um, I decided to continue to maintain and focus him, and I have a bunch of paints that I used of my son's that um, his grandmother bought him. It's a very big art wooden box, and it's got pastels, pencils, paint, any kind of whatever. And um, he and I were very much into art, and with these, with this resource, it got him very interested in being more creative. How long have you been into art? Um, ever since I can remember. As a child. You like to draw? I like to do anything artistic. And I know, you know, we saw some of the pictures of your apartment, but it looks like there was pictures and artwork up. Is that all your work and George's work? The majority of it, yes, are uh, belongings from my home, um, and then also some of George's, yes, on the wall. Was he pretty good at art as well? Yes. 
All right. So you both enjoyed doing that? Very much. So y'all got out uh, Lucas's art set. What did y'all do with that? Um, we were just, I guess, doodling, you know, whatever. I would always tell him that everything that you make is a masterpiece. So um, just let loose and just let it go. And we would just paint and, and no, drink. paint and drink, yes, and uh, listen to music sometimes, and yes. Okay. Now, with the dogs, did y'all get the dogs involved? Oh, yes. My dogs follow me. Yes. Is there some dancing going on with the dogs? Yes. After we had completed the puzzle and um, I guess we're painted out, um, I thought that it might be a good point for us to maybe listen to some music. Um, and the music that George listens to is a little, it's very fractious to me. And it was definitely not going to lighten the mood. So we ended up finding some channel on the radio and um, he was feeling it. And then we ended up, my one dog um, gets very active and was dancing with us. And we were just um, having a good time listening to music. And uh, I guess it's getting pretty late in the evening. Yes. Anything else I've missed? All right. So tell us, tell us where y'all ended up before, before you started the game of hide and seek. Uh, we were there. I couldn't think of anything else possibly that I had to continue entertainment. But I remember sitting at the end of the couch and him sitting in my son's one of my son's chairs that was in the living room and just kind of doing this. Like, what are we going to do now? Like, I very much would like to go to sleep. Um, had y'all had y'all finished off the uh, that bottle that he had bought? I don't remember, to be honest with you. Bless you. Would it be fair to say that as the day wore on, the more y'all consumed? Yes. Uh, and would it be fair to say that as the day wore on, the more you consume, the more the more effects you felt from the alcohol? Of course, yes. Oh, both of you? Yes. Okay. So you would agree, would you not, that at the time y'all were trying to figure out something to do and you put your hand on the couch, that y'all, would it be fair to say that y'all were intoxicated? Yes. Tell the jury what happened. Um, at one point, I guess he knew that I couldn't come up with anything else, um, tapped me on my knee and said, you're it. So from there, I ran up the stairs and hid into um, our shower, um, just waiting for him to find me so we could hopefully go to sleep soon at some point. And, um, and your shower, is it, uh, is it a tub or just a walk-in? It's a tub, um, but it's in the master bedroom, and you have to go all the way upstairs, you have to go in the bedroom, and then you have to go into the bathroom part, and then there's the shower part. So did you lay down in the tub? I, at first, at one point, yes, I was. So you were hiding? I was trying. Okay. And did you believe that he was going to come try to find you? Yes. Did you wait? Yes, for quite some time. All right. Then what did you decide to do? That I decided that I need to go to sleep. I'm picking my son up the next day, and we need to start wrapping up the evening. Um, and I went downstairs to find where he was. And what <clears throat> I think I think the jury has seen pictures of your. Would you call it an apartment or? It's considered a townhome. A townhome. So you walk down the stairs, right? Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of the stairs is a bookshelf here? Yes, at the very end of it, yes. Okay. So you walk down the stairs and you turn and look in the living room. Did you, what did you see? Um, I don't even think I made it all the way down the stairwell because I was just looking for him as soon as I could um, to hopefully go upstairs as soon as we could. And um, I saw, I looked over and I saw him settling himself in the suitcase. All right, tell us about the suitcase. How, how long... Is it an older suitcase? Yes. Whose, whose suitcase was it? This is George's suitcase. All right. And did he use it for traveling back and forth to Philly? Yes. I had uh, recently taken him on a trip to go see his children in Pennsylvania, who he hasn't seen in years. 
and we took that with us. And uh, because of how dilapidated it was, how broken it was, um, in the end, after that trip, we decided that we would donate it. All right. And uh, I understand y'all kept y'all kept the suitcase upstairs. Yes. How long did y'all keep it upstairs? Since we had moved in. Oh. Is there a is there a closet up there you kept it in? Yes, it was in the master closet, um, the master bedroom closet, all the way in the back because of um, the size of it, and there was nowhere to put it, so it's all the way in the back. So when did y'all decide to move it down from upstairs to downstairs? Was it that day or sometime earlier? No, it was um, maybe a week or so prior. Okay. And so what, y'all were going to donate that to Goodwill? or? Yes, we were going to do, I guess, a spring cleaning. Um, my... Anyone who has children understands that they grow quickly, and there was a lot of clothes that I needed to um, go through um, of my sons, and then also from George and I moving in and just kind of putting everything in there. You know, at one point where we just needed to actually go through it and organize it and get things um, more in order. So, is that the reason it was downstairs? <coughs> you were going to donate it and a bunch of things that you were going to put inside of it. Correct. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> So it had been down there a week. So it was already down there. Yes, George brought it down. Okay. So you said that you got down there, you're looking for him, you see him settling into the suitcase. Yes. What did you do? In my head, I said, oh, man, um, we're obviously not going to be going to sleep anytime soon. And um, I walked over, and um, he was trying to get himself flat, so I couldn't tell that he was in there. And then... Now, let, let me stop you there. The suitcase, is it the suitcase over here in the... Yes. Well, you've seen it. You saw it. Yes. Uh, it's a pretty big suitcase. Yes. How, how big is George? George was my height. Um, and how tall are you? I'm 5'3". Okay. And how much did uh, George weigh? I, I thought it was 100 pounds. Okay. And how much did you weigh? Um, I was 98 pounds. All right. Do you agree you, you put on some weight? Since I've been incarcerated, yes. Well, at the time, though, y'all were, y'all were pretty skinny. Yes. So, um, from the pictures, it looks like y'all were both pretty thin. Yes. Um, all right. So, because of his thinness, um, uh, is that how, and, and he's, he's a small man. Yes. So he was able to get in the suitcase on his own? Yes. Did he willingly get in the suitcase? He was already in there. Okay. When you got to him, did he see you? Yes. All right. Tell us what happened. Um, I I mean, I just kind of I zipped him up. We thought it was funny. And um, we're joking about how he was I guess, small enough to fit inside of the suitcase. All right. So what happened then? Um, from there, it was just, um, we were laughing about it, and um, it was just strange that he was small enough to fit in there, and then um, I kind of moved it around a little bit with him in the suitcase still. It was still funny that he was still in the suitcase, just, I think he and I were just kind of believe that he was he could fit in the suitcase did you eventually close the top yes in order for well the top was already closed as he was settling himself in there it was that's how i knew he was in there was because the top was kind of flopping a little bit okay. so he had gotten in there to hide and he pulled the top yes on top of it but you could tell he was in there yes you saw him right away yes all right so at some point did you zip him up did yes you, and what was he saying or doing when you were zipping him up? I just thought it was funny. Um, were well, you both laughing? Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, so you zipped him up. Were y'all still laughing once you zipped him up? Yes. Okay. Tell us, tell the jury what happened then. Um, from there, I just I moved the suitcase around uh, a couple of times, just kind of with on the wheels and moved it around and. Um, at that point, it was still, it was funny. We were joking and laughing about it. All right, now, eventually, did you go sit down on the couch and get your phone? Um, yes. Um, the, oh, this is something. 
Um, well, I, the suitcase had, um, for me moving it around had flopped, was flopped over. So while it was like that, I thought at that point I had a moment to, I guess, take the time to talk to him while I guess he was not able to get out for a moment. So you flipped it. You got, you got it on the top, right? Yeah. It gets in, but at some point you flip it over so he, the zipper is on the bottom. Well, it was just kind of how I was moving it around that it ended up kind of flopping, so. It was upside down. Yes. So after you did that, what did you do? Um, that's when I, I went over and decided to um, videotape to just see the, um, I guess, the, the jest in it for him to understand that right now I feel safe and right now I have the ability to actually speak to you um, in a manner that normally I would not have the ability to do. Um. And you were intoxicated. Yes. And you would agree that you said some things you should not. Have. Yes. But you, you realized he could not get out and get at you. Is that fair? At that moment, yes. So the, it goes on for about 10 minutes. Um, yes. You, you heard it here today, did you not? Yes. You heard, you heard his voice as he was speaking from the suitcase. Yes. That was his voice on the video and audio. Yes. And you heard your voice on the video and audio. Yes. That was your voice. Yes. All those things said by the man were said by George in that two minute video. Correct. All the words said by the female were said by you in that two minute video. Correct. Were you intending on showing him the video the next day? Yes. At the time or the next day, is it fair to say you don't even remember a video thing? I do not. So, from what you can tell from watching it, did that refresh your memory about that event? I did. Why did you say all that? All right, I'm talking about just the two minute video part that was recorded. Could you just tell the jury what you were feeling? what your feelings were at the time, and then explain, just explain that to the jury. You, you mentioned, you talked about it before. You said he was in that confined space and it was my chance, but is that, do you want to elaborate on that or? Sure, I, I want you all to know that I, the majority of the time, I'm always afraid and always scared. All right, well, I understand that. Yeah, I understand that, but, um, would it be fair to say that you had some anger at that point? I did. I Would it be fair to say that you wanted to tell him off to some degree? I just wanted, yes, for him to have a better understanding, um, which was the whole point of the videos and documentation prior. And you could tell that he was uncomfortable? I'm guessing. And did, did you want him to feel some uncomfort? I did. Okay. Now, at some point, you turned off the video. Yes. And then we saw a second video, which is approximately 11 minutes later. And you've seen that video. It was played to the jury. It was 22 seconds long. Yes. And I don't think you speak in that video. You hear George say Sarah one time. Yes. Is that fair to say? Yes. So between... The two minute video and the 22 second video is an 11 minute period. Would you tell the jury what happened? Um, we continued to, I guess, speak to one another and um, his tone changed and I knew the tone and um, we ended up, I guess, arguing back and forth with one another and It was the things that he was saying um, very much frightened me and um, cursing at me and threatening me. 
And did he want you to let him out of the suitcase? Um, I'm I'm sure so. Go ahead, tell tell me. Um, and it just got it got very heated very quickly, and he continued to push on the suitcase, and um. My fear was that he was going to break out of the suitcase, knowing that it was a broken suitcase. And um, his hand started to come through. His his hand started to come through this way. And so I shook the suitcase. I shook the suitcase, trying to get his hand to go back in, shaking it, and telling him that, please stop doing this. Please, please stop doing this to me. Please stop doing this to me. So his hand, his hand actually got out of the suitcase. Yes. And you went to the suitcase. Yes. And shook it. Yes. Did that force his hand to go back in? No. Um, so you're shaking it. Were you shaking it to try to get the suitcase, his hand back in? Yes. How long did you shake it? I don't know. But his hand was still out? Yes. Was he trying to get out? Forcefully, yes. Was he angry at you? Yes. Were you in fear? Always. If he would have gotten out of the suitcase, what would he have done to you? Like he used to tell me, he probably would have made me unrecognizable or I would have uh, lost my life. Did you lose the grip on the suitcase? Yes. Where was the bat in relation to the suitcase? Um, it was um, leaning up against the dining room table right there. How far was the bat from the suitcase? Three feet, two feet. Was his hand still out of the suitcase? Yes. And was he getting out of the suitcase? He very much was trying, yes. And so what did you do? For the split second reaction that I had, I happened to see that and I grabbed the baseball bat and was trying to poke his hand to go back in to please don't go, don't break through, please. So I hit his hand. What did you hit? The outside part of his hand. Yes. We've seen the photographs of his left hand. Did you cause the bruising there? I'm guessing yes. Now, you've seen the bat. It's a, uh, a youth bat? Yes, I bought it for my son. Is this the bat you used? Yes. You said you poked him with it? Yes, I I kind of pushed, um, like I held it with the skinny part here and then... So the so grip here. Brought it at it, yes. You grabbed, you, you grabbed it with both hands here. Yes. And then the barrel of the bat, the big part of the bat is here. Correct. And you thrusted it in, into the s different areas of the suitcase? I started with his hand, and his hand, he was still trying to get out. He was still trying to do that. So I started to push on the suitcase around it, hoping to have his hand retract and go back inside. You made those injuries. I did. We've seen the photographs. Yes. We see the, the bruising. Is that from that bat? Yes. Eventually, did his hand go back inside from you doing? Yes, finally he had, had subsided and retracted his hand. So in your mind, did you prevent him from attacking you? Absolutely. Split second decision. Now, once he retracted his hand, did you, do you remember zipping it up some? Or what did you do in relation? Because he, he was upside down, was he not, at that point? Yes. At some point, you flipped him back up. I did. Tell, tell how that happened. He wasn't <laughs> cursing. He wasn't threatening. He, his hand was inside foremost. There was no more of him trying to break through the suitcase. So I felt safe enough to turn it back over. It wasn't, it wasn't happening anymore. You went back to the video and the couch? I did, yes. We saw the second video? Yes. The 22 second, and he's right side up again? Yes. And you hear him say, Sarah? Yes. Had you left enough room for him to get out? Zipper to zipper. Yes, that's how his hand was trying. 
That, that suitcase has two zippers, doesn't it? And they meet at various places along the line? Correct. How much room? When you flipped it over, how much room was between zipper to zipper? I don't know specifically. I mean, it was enough to where his hand was coming out. After you had hit him with the bat, was he not trying to get out anymore? No. Did you believe that he could breathe in there? Yes. Did you ever believe he could die in there? No. At all. Were you trying to kill him? Never. Did you want to kill him? I did not. Did you walk upstairs? I did, yes. Why didn't you let him out before you walked upstairs? Were you afraid? Terrified is more of the word. As long as he was in the suitcase, he couldn't harm you. Correct. Did you want him to calm down? Yes, I wanted him to stop being angry because I know what it is for him to be angry. You went upstairs. Where were the dogs? The dogs ran upstairs with me. And where did they go? Um, on the bed. Did you have the phone with you? Yes. I know at some point you called your husband, Brian, did you not? I did. Do you recall how long that conversation was? Not very long. Can you recall what was said? I don't remember exactly. No, I don't. Miss Boone, Sarah Boone, you said that uh, when he was in the suitcase, he was threatening her, threatening you. Can you tell the jury what he was saying? I don't know. Am I allowed to curse? Yes. Um, but he was going to fucking end me. And it... That's what made me ask him please to stop doing what he's doing to me. That he was going to, I'm guessing, try his best that night to probably take my life. But what... The, the threat you heard was he's... He's going to... Say, say the word. Fucking end me. Excuse me? Fucking end me. End you? Yes. How many people in this court are thinking of killing her right now? Be honest. <clears throat> Judge, can we approach the bench? Yes. I have a matter that I have to discuss with counsel at this point in time outside of your presence. So I'm going to ask you to retire to the deliberation room. We'll bring you back in as promptly as possible. Thank you. There it is. Thank you. Y'all may be seated. Thank you. State, you can proceed with any argument at this point in time. Judge, I believe that's pretty close to what we already knew from the deposition testimony uh, from the doctors relaying what she said for the proffer. What we have here is testimony from the defendant. Um, her timeline is she comes downstairs after having gone up to the shower and hiding, laying down um, after being declared to be it. She comes back downstairs, and before she gets back to the bottom of the stairwell, she can see that um, the victim is in the suitcase trying to get flat uh, because the lid is flopping and he's not, he's not hidden just yet. Um, and so she comes over. And I believe she testified she was moving it around before uh, actually zipping the lid shut, but moving it around, everybody's laughing. It's all fun and games still. And then she zips it and it's still fun and games and, and everybody's laughing. And then at this point, she testifies that this is now her opportunity to get on her pulpit to express her true feelings about everything. And that's when she sits down on the couch and opens up her phone device and begins recording what later turns out to be IMG uh, underscore 1062 movie at 11, 12, 45 for two minutes and three seconds. During this period of time, the decedent is expressing uh, meekly that he can't breathe. Uh, the only time he ever curses at her is, Sarah, I can't fucking breathe. Babe, I can't fucking breathe. Um, he is demonstrating under the law that he is in fear uh, of losing his life. Um, she has committed an aggravated assault. She has committed false imprisonment. She was the initial aggressor. 
There was no overt act to justify these actions that she took against her boyfriend. She then goes on to say that during this period of time between the end of the movie at 11, 14, 48 seconds and before the next one starts at 11, 23, that it's now at this time, while he's still constrained and clearly unable to get out under his own power despite having his hand out, um, she begins beating him with a bat, um, poking his hands, poking the suitcase with a deadly weapon. A bat is used for baseball, but it can also be used to harm another person. And according to the medical examiner's testimony, there was great harm caused to him, deep ecchymosis bruises. She can't start to do this out of fear, like the analogy I gave earlier. If I pull a gun to rob you, judge, and you pull a gun, I can't shoot you in self-defense. She, she started this. She started this. There was no overt act, um, and therefore, um, we're asking for you to prevent, under the case law, uh, any prior instances of violence, um, any reputation evidence, and any battered spouse syndrome evidence, um, because that's simply just what the case ended up being. Thank you. Response. Judge, this was a game by two intoxicated people. When people are drunk and intoxicated, they do silly and stupid things. The evidence is uncontroverted that George Torres willingly, by his own choice, elected to hide in the suitcase. By their interaction between the two of them, giggling and laughing at each other, he consented to her zipping up the suitcase. And the playful nature of what was going on during those few minutes prior to the video. When the video is turned on, there's a two minute period where they're talking. He's saying, I need to get out. I can't breathe. She's not taking him seriously. As you've seen from the videos, I thought it was the boy crying wolf. She did not appreciate the fact that he could be actually having trouble breathing. And this was a chance for him to be heard by her about how she felt about some things involving their relationship. A short time later, the video was turned off, and then that period has been testified to by my client. And that period is uncontributed. That's a second period of time. We've got that time for the video. We got the 11 minutes, we got the 22 seconds. And there's no video, there's no audio, there's no eyewitness, there's nothing but Sarah Boone's testimony. And she's testified here today that they had words, there were threats, he got his hand out of the suitcase. She knew by the threats and him getting his hand out of the suitcase that he was about to get out of the suitcase and he was going to hurt her. A reasonable person under that scenario would believe he, she was about to be harmed. She was an imminent threat of harm. She blocked that attack by grabbing the bat, hitting his hand. When that didn't work, she started poking him with the bat in the suitcase. Eventually, she poked him several times. He put his hand inside the suitcase. She put the bat up. When she realized he was not going to do that any further, she flipped him over right side up. She still had a fear knowing that if he got out, she would be harmed. He would beat her up. She went upstairs. That is an overt act based on the discussions, coupled with the fact that he threatened her, using the word, I'm going to fucking end it for you, or some words to that effect. I don't remember her exact words just before she went upstairs while he was still in the suitcase. If she would have let him out, and this is a crime. Now, now this is an event involving an omission, failure to act, failure to unzip him at that point before she went upstairs. The failure to act, the failure to unzip, which would have let him out, um, which would have created a situation that she believed was imminent bodily harm to herself. And I guess I'd get a, a couple of examples. Um, let's say that a police officer is called to a scene and the only thing he hears is uh, there is a suspect and the suspect may be armed. So of course the officer pulls out his revolver and he's walking around, well then eventually he finds the suspect and the suspect reaches for his waist 
The officer doesn't see the gun, but the officer sees the movement to the waist. The officer fires and shoots the suspect. The officer is justified because there's an immediate threat of harm. The officer has to react instinctively. There's no time to think. Wow, that is garbage. George was trapped inside a suitcase. Is this guy serious? No time to think. He's trapped in a suitcase. What kind of moron would it take to fall for this? I'm speechless. Earlier, he said George agreed to being zipped up in the suitcase by laughing about it. Now that is a new level of stupid. Similar to the actions that Sarah Boone had to take. Another example, you're in a bar with your buddies and you've had something to drink and another group has had something to drink and one of your buddies gets into an argument with one of the buddies on the other party. And one of your friends seeing that it's being escalated and the, the guy that's arguing with your buddy is aggressive, more aggressive than your buddy is. Your buddy's trying to settle the thing, but this other individual, maybe he's had too much to drink and he's more aggressive. So you go around behind this individual and before he's able to strike your buddy, you grab him. You lock him up. That's physical restraint to block an attack. Or you grab him by the neck and you choke him. Physical restraint to block an attack. That's what she was doing with the suitcase. If she let him out of the suitcase, she was going to be harmed based on him trying to get out with his hand based on the threats he made while he had his hand out and based on the threats he made while he had his hand inside just before she went upstairs. Thank you. Thank you. The court's going to review all the case law that it's obtained in its research in this matter and come back with a oral ruling momentarily. Thank you. The court has uh, the opportunity to review the case law, review the arguments provided by both the state and the defense court finds that a overt act has been established. The case law is clear that a scintilla of the providing of an overt act is sufficient to provide the self-defense jury instruction. Um, an overt act is not something that's specifically defined in Florida case law. It's something that's from the totality of the circumstances, seemingly under the authorities that the court has reviewed. As such, the court is going to find that under Holland, a Overt Act has been established and will allow the, dissent, the uh, defense to proceed with evidence of reputation and specific instances of conduct and battered spouse evidence so long as the necessary predicates are established for those items. Any questions or clarifications with regard to the court's order state? Yes. Defense. Okay. If we can bring Ms. Boone back up to the witness stand once she is seated, we can bring back in our panel. Let's go ahead and stand and bring back in our panel. All right, thank you all can be seated. Mr. Owens, you may continue with your inquiry, sir. So I think we left off. You had called um, your ex-husband? Yes. All right. After, after you called your ex-husband, what happened after that? I ended up falling asleep. Do you remember waking up the next morning? Yes. Did you sleep in? Not intentionally. Okay. But you didn't get up at 8 o'clock, did you? No. Did you wake up closer to noon? I believe so, yes. Did you check the time? No. Did you hear some phone, your phone ringing? Yes, my phone ringing. And uh, did you answer it right away? No. Do you know how approximately how, how many times it rang before you answered it? Um, I believe the call was about three times. Did you know who was called? I think it was my ex-husband. And why would he be calling? Um, to make sure that um, I was still on schedule to pick up our son. At three that afternoon? Correct. And he goes to school there close by? Yes. When you woke up, did you stay in bed for a while? For a little while, yes. All right, tell the jury what happened when you got up. I knew it was my ex-husband calling um, repeatedly. Um, 
I didn't answer right away because one of our problems is that he doesn't understand that I'm doing things around the apartment and looking for jobs and so on and so forth. So I inevitably just let it ring and I sat or I laid in the bed and I figured that George was downstairs either drinking or um, looking for jobs um, or may have just left. And so eventually I decided to get out of the bed and start moving to go downstairs. I was motivated enough to go downstairs. And um, when I went downstairs, it was very quiet. So I had the understanding, I believed that he had left. Um, and Did you check to see if he was, where would he be looking for a job at? Um, usually on the couch, he would have my son's laptop and he and I, which we would share. Y'all only have the, the son's laptop? Correct. And the TV was not working at this time? The TV was not there. Okay. So you thought he would be in the living room on, on the laptop? Yes. He was not there? No. Where else did you look for him? Um, I looked on the back porch. Um, I went through the front door um, to see if my car was there, thinking maybe he had taken my car. Um, I checked the bathroom, and when I was checking the bathroom, I saw the suitcase, and I remember about the night prior, and I unzipped the suitcase, and... Let me stop you there. You said you were in the bathroom when you saw the suitcase, or coming out of the bathroom? No, where our bathroom is, I would have to go to the bathroom here, and then when I turned around, I noticed the suitcase, and I remembered. How did you feel when you saw the suitcase? I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that before. Describe it to the jury. I guess it was... I was aghast, and... I just can't describe the feeling. Bless you. It was terror to Bless you. a certain degree. I'm sorry. Say that again now. It was terror to a certain degree. Um... I just can't describe it in words, the feeling of remembering. And then he was still in there. So what did you do? I immediately unzipped the, I immediately unzipped the suitcase and I was screaming, George, George, George. And I was shaking him. I was shaking him and I pulled him out and I stretched him out flat. And then I began instantly trying to do CPR and then was trying to look for a pulse or a breath or just anything and um, was just screaming his name over and over and over again and come on George, come on George. And I continued CPR, continued CPR and I continued CPR and um, he was gurgling and... What color was he? What color was he? Yes. He was purple. At some point did you call your, your ex-husband? Yes, when he started to gurgle, and I knew that my my ex-husband is notorious for bringing my son over in very inopportune times when George is possibly drunk or doing things not appropriate for my son to see. And um, I just didn't know what to do. It was just a quick knee-jerk reaction. Brian was kind of my go-to person because of my family being deceased and I don't have anyone else that I can call. Um, and I just wanted to ensure that he would not bring my son over in the process of all of this. So you called him? I called him. Did you ask him what to do? Or did you just tell him to come over? I just told him to come over. Did you tell him that you felt like George was dead? Yes, I did. And how far... You said it's five minutes from house to house? Yes. Did you call him back? Yes, because he was taking so long. It felt seconds were hours. Yes. I'm still doing CPR at the same time in the process of it. I'm now, doing CPR I don't know how many times. Did he get there? Yes. Did he walk in? Yes. Did he walk out? Yes. What did he tell you to do? Call 911. What did you do? I... Called 911. Is that the recording we've heard here in this trial? Yes. Would you love George? I 
to to this day. Why did you want to leave? George was very passionate. George was a very real person. George was nice to me on the good days. George complimented me. George and I were two bodies with one soul, he and I would always say. I don't believe that I've ever had a connection with anyone like I have with George. Did you have that connection with your ex-husband? I did not. Was it even close? No. Well, then I would call Brian Boone a very lucky individual because he dodged a suitcase. George has some good traits, doesn't he? Very much. Did George have some bad traits? He did. Did you drink too much? I did. Did George drink too much? Yes. Tell the jury about George's drink. If George was able to, he would drink from sun up to sundown. And me having my son and trying to work and maintain the home and just have a life, a normal life as best as I could, somehow that upset George. And because I had a certain dollar amount from my divorce settlements, at one point, it was from wine we could afford, vodka. So a lot of the times, he would take my car and my debit card and go buy the large, we call them handles, of vodka, which is the big, big bottle. And sometimes he would finish that all off on his own throughout an entire period um, of, a, of, a day, of a day into an evening. That's honestly where I thought that he was going to be that morning when I came downstairs because he's notorious for just automatically already being outside from drinking all the time. You said you have an alcohol problem. George has an alcohol problem. Yes. How did George's drinking adversely affect you? It would debilitate my ability to help him the way that I was always trying to help him because it would be one good day, a day of survival, um, and then it would be another day where I'm having to peel him off of me and call 911. Why, why would he get that way? Tell us, tell us his pattern as it relates to drinking and then... Objection. Approach. Objections overruled for now. You already go the three and a half years? Yes. Is there times when, when he would get to a, a state of intoxication where he would get violent against you? Quite often. Would you look at those photographs and see if you recognize those? I do. Are those two pictures of your body? Yes. Do they sew injuries to your body? Yes. Were those injuries caused by George Torres? Yes. Are those photographs a fair and accurate depiction of the injuries you sustained at the hands of George Torres? On this occurrence, yes. You remember this occurrence? I don't. It was so often. You don't remember a specific, specific date? I don't. But you're sure that that's you? Yes. Is that the injuries that he... What's the injury to the rib cage? Um... I don't remember specifically. This may, these may be the pictures. So, uh, when we used to go up to his brother's house, his one of his brothers and his okay. sustained. Do you know what happened to? Did, did George cause these injuries? Yes. Did, were y'all both drinking at that time? I don't remember on this distance. Ms. Gould, is that you? Yes. Are those injuries to your arm? Yes. Were they caused by George Torres? Yes. And during the same incident, is this you? Yes. Is that an injury or bruise to your uh, ribcage area? Yes. And your arm? Yes. Is that your thigh? Yes. Do you remember this incident? Yes. Can you tell the jury what happened? 
I wanted to take my dogs for a walk and get off of the back porch. Y'all drinking? Yes. And um, he was upset that I would rather go walk my dogs than um, sit there and continue to drink. Um, so he slapped my thigh as possibly hard as he possibly could and said that you're not going anywhere. And it was, it was a good smack on my thigh. Is that a fair and accurate depiction of the, uh, the wound that you suffered as a result of George Torres slapping you on the thigh? Yes. And for the jury to say, is this the photograph you just mentioned? Yes. See if you recognize that photograph? I do. Oh, is that your hand? Yes. Is that your blood on your hand? Yes, it is. Is that you standing, looks like, in a room with flip-flops? This was in the kitchen at Brian's house. Okay, what happened there? So, George was very drunk, and um, I wanted to leave, and he's notorious for taking my car keys and putting them around his neck, and my phone in his, his crotch area and telling me to come get them. And I really wanted to leave because of how drunk, and I knew the escalation of his anger. I didn't want to be there when it was at its peak. So I tried to take my keys from around him because he kept taunting me to take my keys, come get your keys. And so I attempted to go and get my keys. And so um, he ended up getting a butcher knife. And um, I called, I had an opportunity to call Brian to come and help me, to please come pick me up, to come get me. And of course, he brings my son with him. And so I'm in the parking lot asking Brian to please help me get my car keys away from him. And there's neighbors and it's a, it's a scene at this point. And George comes to the doorway of my townhome wielding the butcher knife saying that, do I curse? Yeah. That no one's going to take her fucking keys. No one's going to fucking come into this house. And he's waving the butcher knife. And, um, I walked up to him and I, I just wanted to leave and my little son who was I believe seven or eight at the time just is screaming, give mommy her keys, give mommy her keys, let her leave. Brian was even trying to negotiate with him saying, please, you know, you know she'll come back, just, just, let, her, just let her leave. So I went up to try and take the keys from him and he was pulling on them and I ended up pulling harder. And um, he pulled them back again to try to pull me in the house, and I pulled them even harder, and it ripped my finger. And I, at one point, the, I had lost the fingernail, and the tip of my pinky was severely gashed. Ms. Ben, for the jury's sake, is this the picture you were referring to? <coughs> is, that, is that the nail, or was it the dog? I believe so, yes. Can you look at those photographs? To tell the jury what they are. I wanted to eat, and I, while he was drinking, um, went and made myself, uh, as quickly as I possibly could, a microwave bowl of, I believe it was broccoli and cheddar soup. And I didn't get it out enough time, and he came up behind me, and he slapped it out of my hand. And it was a second degree burn. I went to the hospital for it. Um, Are those fair and accurate depictions of the injury of the burn to your thigh? Yes. You had to go to the hospital as a result of these injuries to your thigh? Yes. It was okay. extremely is this, painful. Is that a depiction of the burn? Yes. Is that your thigh? My thigh, yes. And your knee? Yes. Did you look at those all four before commenting? This is a longer story, isn't it? <clears throat> Go ahead and tell. So, George stabbed me in my leg. I almost bled to death. All right, well, let's, let's go back and explain what led up to that. I thought it would be nice to cook a nice steak dinner. We don't have two nickels rubbed together, so I thought it would be special to make a steak dinner and baked potato and 
go above the normal whatever's left over in the refrigerator. And um, so I spent a lot of time doing that. And um, George was drinking the entire time. And on the back porch. You were drinking as well, did you not? I was drinking. Um, he was on the back porch while I was in the house and I was cooking. And um, it was one of those where maybe if I start making dinner now, it will be over at a particular time and we can go to bed at a reasonable time. And um, I even put it in the bedroom and had a movie set up for us to watch. Um, so it would just kind of be dinner in bed. And then um, he came upstairs and saw that I had made the steak dinner and I don't know how to describe how drunk he was, but it definitely was not George. And um, had him come lay on the bed, sit on the bed and, you know, put the, um, I, I got the dogs out and um, I presented him with the steak dinner and um, sat down and uh, was getting ready to start playing the movie. And um, he starts being very rude and cursing the steak and finding fault with it. And then, um, you know, I'm having to encourage him to eat. You know, if you want me to cut it up for you, I will cut it up for you. Did you want some more sour cream for your, pota your potato? What can I do to make you happier? And um, then he started to pull on me and kept saying that, excuse me, that I just want to fuck you, fuck you on the steak and fuck you on the, on the potatoes. And I took offense to that and I kept trying to encourage him to eat. I started to eat. Is this just him really drunk and saying nonsense? I don't know why he was so angry that day. I don't know if it's because I was... I, I got steak. I don't know. I, most of the time, I don't know the reason why. Um, so um, I couldn't take it anymore. Obviously, I was not going to be able to eat. So I started to crawl off of the bed to leave, um, just, just the bedroom. And he told me again that I'm not going anywhere. And he stabbed me in my leg. And it crunched. You could hear a noise that it made. And Blood just started to come out of my leg, just like a fountain. So I got off of the bed. He's starting to freak out and um, grabbed me a, a towel. Um, I got a wet towel, and I'm sitting here holding the towel, and um, it's increasingly becoming even more and more saturated saturated by the minute. It's just minutes. So I'm going my, uh, through towels and towels, and I said, George, I think I need to go to the hospital. This is not this is not stopping to bleed. This is serious. And um, he got on his knees and begged me, please don't call the police. Please don't call the police. Please don't call the police. Um, and inevitably, he went and got my car keys and put them around his neck again and my cell phone. So I was not able to call him, call anyone, and I wasn't able to leave in my car. So... I figured I would just go downstairs and I'm just going to go downstairs. And I had propped my foot up on the glass table that we had and blood is just everywhere. Blood is everywhere. Um, I can't keep up with the amount of blood and I'm starting to feel very weak and really weird. And he comes downstairs and he's still begging me, please don't call 911. Please don't call 911. I, I kept telling him there's something, this is serious. This is, this is something um, because he knew that he would probably get arrested or something bad would happen to him. So I, I couldn't take him anymore. He was just all over me and just, I'm bleeding. I'm, I'm bleeding very badly, and he's having me try to console him. And I kept telling him, please, I need to call 911, P please. And I said, okay, just let me, just give me a moment. And I crawled upstairs to my son's bathroom, which is the furthest bathroom away from everything, and I remember holding onto the sink and I looked into the mirror and my lips were blue and I, I knew I needed help. I, I, I needed help. And he came upstairs looking frantic for me, calling my name. And then, um, I turned to him and I said, please, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die. I, I've lost a lot of blood. There's something wrong. My lips are blue. Please. 
please. We don't have to call an ambulance. If you could just take me, just I'll drive whatever I can do, please, to go to the hospital for this. And he said that before anything happens, I had to concoct a story in order for him to not be arrested or be in trouble when we did inevitably get to the hospital. So I'm sitting there with this blood-soaked towel with blue lips trying to come up with a story of what I can tell them when I go down there so he's not in trouble and telling him that it's okay. And I came up with the the story of that we were sword fighting silly after drinking with our steak knives and he accidentally punctured my leg. And from there... How did you get to the hospital? Originally, um, he told me to drive, and because of the amount of alcohol that he drank, and it, it was, I couldn't. So um, he got into the driver's seat and drove me, and the entire time he's barking at me to make sure that I get the story straight. We're sword fighting, okay? We were drunk, you know, did you go to, did you go being to the silly. Hospital? Yes. Uh, and then uh, you get treated there. Yes. Um, right. I, I was bloody, and... Um, let me show you the photograph. I'll show you these? Yes. All right. Is this a fair and accurate depiction of the uh, injury to your leg? Yes. I had to go to two different hospitals for it. And uh, you lied to uh, medical personnel about how this happened? Yes. They brought in sheriffs and everything. Was it consistent with... They brought in sheriffs? Did you, did you have to answer to the law enforcement officer? Yes. Did you uh, stick with the story that you and George had agreed? I did. And was this, is this you at the hospital? Yes. Is this the staff when you see the letter? Yes. Is this a close up of the staff when Yes. And is that, what was that? Did you hurt your foot? No, due to the injury, I had. Um, other problems with the, the surgery. Okay. But you eventually mm -hmm. recovered? Eventually, yes. Do you have a scar to that effect? I do. There's a lock, sir. <laughs> Out. Oh. <laughs> All right, I don't know how there has to be this judge because we've got this ball. Well, they can probably see it in there. Is this, is this the injury here? Looks like there's an injection. You recognize that photograph? I do. Yes. All right. Looks like you got an injury to your lip and to your face. Do you recall this event? I was trying to sleep and. Have y'all been drinking? I, I'm, I'm sure. Um, I know that he had been drinking. This was one of the instances where I would go upstairs to try to go to sleep. And but y'all drank together a lot, did you not? Sometimes, yes. But there were times where he wanted to stay up and continue to drink, and you wanted to go to bed. Many times, yes. You were done. He was not. Correct. Was that one of these times? Yes. So tell us what happened. I'm sleeping in the bed sound asleep, and he comes into the room and grabs me by my hair a lot of the times, and from here he scratched me from trying to grab me and then grabbed my hair and pulled me off of the bed and then raked my face across the carpet. These are, these are carpet burns. To your lips? Yes. What about to the, looks like the eyebrow area? That's from where he, from grabbing me, scratched me and got a hold of me by my hair. Why was he mad at you? Because I wasn't downstairs with him. He wanted you to be drinking with him? All the time. All right, you see the injury between the eyes and uh, the injury to the lip? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that you described? Yes, and then the blood going down my eye, yes. Can you describe that photograph? I can. Go ahead. Uh, this was the first time that I ever called 911. Um, George and I had gone to a bar across the street within walking distance, and um, 
at some point, uh, I asked a, a guy, or he asked me, somehow or another, it was over a cigarette. And um, he left, and I didn't know where he went, and the bartender said, oh, he, he left. He took your car and he left. So, um... Why would he do that? Well, I found out when I got home, it was because I spoke to a, another man. And, um, so I paid the tab and I, I walked home and he's sitting on the back porch with the handle of vodka and I was walking on eggshells and terrified and kind of treaded lightly when I came in and he acted all natural and fine. So I didn't know the reason why, but he had just gotten up and left with my car so then, um, he calls me a whore. I'm a whore. And then he calls me a slut. And then he calls me a cunt. And gets up and pushes me. And he pushed me with both of his hands so hard that we have um, this little area where our washer and dryer is. And there are metal doors that are on it. And he pushed me into the metal door. And then I fell back. And he got his knees on top of me on my arms here so I was pinned down and was starting to strangle me and hit my head up against the metal closet over and over and over and over and over it again and calling me a fucking whore. And I'm a whore. You were such a slut and fuck you and everything. And um, I, my tongue was flopping out of my mouth and I, was, I thought I was going to bite my tongue off. And because of the amount of noise I guess my head was making on the metal door, he slid me down and got back on me and then started to strangle me again. And it was on, we have carpet, but it's very, it's like concrete. And I was able to get my arms out from underneath and grab his throat and get him off of me. So I, get, I got him off of me and I pushed him off and he came up and he goes, you fucking bitch. And he stomped my face. And the next thing I know, I woke up, I obviously Did checked out. Him? I'm, I'm obviously, I guess, yes. And um, he was passed out on the floor. And I woke up frantic looking for my phone and I immediately called 911. Okay. The police police arrived on that incident? Yes, they did. Is this a fair and accurate depiction of the injury you sustained as a result of him kicking him? Stomping, yes. St stomp? Stomp. All heel? I saw was his heel. Is that, was that the, the next day or is that a few days later? Um, that's a couple of days later. Well, and that's the bruising from the kicking of his eye? Yes. Now, the police will call, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but let me go to the judge. Do you have to speak here? Yes. Can you um, identify that picture? Um, yes. Is that your leg? Yes. And um, is that, was like the injury to your knee? Yes. Is that a fair and accurate prediction of the injury you sustained to your knee? Yes. How, do you remember how that happened? Yes. Did you tell the jury? I was trying to get off of the back porch, and he grabbed me and pushed me, and it was a rock or a really pe sharp piece of mold um, from him grabbing me and pushing me onto the ground, and I, I guess I just happened to hit my knee just right on whatever it was. Were y'all drinking? Yes. Why, why did he push you? Because I wanted to get off of the back porch. He wanted to stay out there? Yes. He wanted you to be with him? What, what's the deal with him wanting to be with you all the time? Security, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. Did you do your best to please him? And then some, yes. You told the jury no. No, that was just, I got um, the first aid kit that I have for my son and I just cleaned up. You what? I said I got the, um, First aid kit that I had for my son, and I just cleaned it up and put a band-aid on it. What is that photograph of? This is a photograph of my arm. And uh, is that a fair and accurate depiction of your arm with some type of injury? Yes. Do you remember this attempt? Multiple times, yes. 
Well, this, uh, we're talking about this isolated event or this photograph is going to be the injury you sustained. Yep. Who, gets, who, who injured your arm? George Torres. You remember this event? Yes. Can you tell the jury about it? This was one of the instances where I would try to pull away from him, and I don't know how my arm started to do this, but um, from him, him pulling from this way, how hard he would pull, um, with me trying to struggle to get away from him, it, it would leave these bloody, um, under the skin splotches. So he wouldn't hit you sometimes, he would just grab you and pull you? Yes, from me trying to pull away from him, that's the point of it doing this, from me pulling away from him. Now, this is one of the many times y'all were both intoxicated? Um, like, I mean, I can't say for sure, but yes, but whenever it would happen, yes, we would be drinking. All right, it, did, it doesn't look like a, like a wound or anything. Objection to commentary. Sustained. Tell me, I'm sorry, tell me, you said it's just from the, the grip? Him losing his grip? Yes, it would be from me pulling away from him and whatever under the skin it was that it was disturbed from the amount of pressure of him holding and then pulling from me would create those on my arms. Okay. Then what is that picture of? This is a picture of my ear, side of my head. Is that a fair and accurate depiction? Yes. From the injury you sustained by George Torrio? Yes. Do you remember this event? Yes. Were you drinking? I, at the time, was not drinking alcohol. On this event, you were you had not consumed any alcohol. Um, I'm. I mean, I may have earlier. This was another. I was in the bed trying to sleep. Where was George? Um, downstairs drinking. All right. And so, you were, you were wanting to go to bed, and he wanted you to stay down there with him. Yes, I was in the bed. All right. Tell the jury what happened on this event. I believe this was the instant where I was in the bed and he, I used to barricade the door with our dresser. Why didn't you just lock it? Uh, all of the locks were broken in my home. Yeah. Wow. They were from George to him then, including my son's. At one point I could seek refuge in my son's room, but he broke that one as well. Well, so tell me, explain how that happens. Tell the jury, we can't. Read your mind. George wants me, which he has told me numerous times, that I am to be with him at all times and doesn't like to be uh, apart from me or away from me. So whenever it was even just to go to the bathroom sometimes, I, he would go with me. And you have to understand, I have a two-story, 900-square-foot townhome, so there's not many places to go. So it just happened to be that... It would be upstairs or downstairs, or I'd be in a particular room or not. So, um, inevitably. Did you want some time away? Yes, I did. Even if it were just him upstairs or me downstairs or vice versa. So, I rarely got to sleep. Um, this was one of the instances because I had barricaded the door with our, I don't know, 200 pound dresser that we had. And then um, I had my nightstand barricaded up against that, up against the bed to where it was even more difficult from the prior times of him breaking in. Um, and he would, I don't know how he would ever do it, but he would get himself in through the, the crack of the door that he would be able to wedge in, a wedge the dresser in the nightstand. And he pulled me out of the bed and um, told me I was going to die. And um, it's, I believe it's this incident, and then and punched me and... Punched you in the side of the head? Yes, in was my it temple a, and everything. Was it an open fist or a closed fist, or do you know? It was fully closed. Did you? Yeah. Did you get any treatment for that? Um, Medical treatment? I know the police came, but I don't remember... I remember it hurt for a good solid two weeks after that. Was this one of the incidents where the police were called? Yes. Was that the date of the incident? The date of this event? No, it happened prior. I mean, but this picture that was taken of the... This picture was taken, would have been taken February 24th of 2020? Yes. And do you recognize that as your close-up patient? 
Yes. Is that a fair and accurate depiction of how your face looked on February 23rd of 2020? Yes. What's the significance of that? Again, because I was sleeping, um, George was upset with me and came in with a metal curtain rod and bent it and snapped it in half and then crunched me in the forehead with it. Um, and it started to beat the furniture that was in the, um, in the bedroom. Um, it, this is probably a good month uh, before or after it had happened, before I really do believe that I should have gotten stitches, but I was not allowed to go to the hospital. Is that the same curtain rod that you mentioned in the two-hour interrogation video? Which they didn't take in us. Um, that, this was photographs that were taken, the, um, I guess it would have been the, the crime scene. Was it the crime scene, the investigator that came out and took photographs? I don't remember who it was, but yes, someone did on the day of the incident. Was it different from the... Uh, the extraction, the phone extraction expert, was it somebody different? I think. But this, is it this, is it this uh, one right here? Yes, and remember that's a month later. And then on that same date, uh, they took, same time, they took this photograph as well, which is uh, identification R. Yes. All right. And what is that to do? Um, I believe it's from holding the baseball bat. And is that an injury to your hand? It's a bruise. Was that taken? Um, February, was it February twenty third, twenty twenty, when the investigators came out on the February twenty fourth? February twenty fourth. But uh, February twenty fourth of twenty twenty, is that what you were wearing? Is that you? Yes. And there's some discoloration up here of your palm. You see that? I do. Is that from you jabbing him with a baseball bat? Sustained. You know how you suffered that injury? I believe it's from holding the baseball bat. Will you help him with it? Yes, trying to get his hand back in. See if you recognize them? Yes. And... Are those fair and accurate depictions? Yes. As a composite of the events that occurred in relation to George Torres and the t your TV? Yes. Right. Is that Are those stills of a videotape that you took? Yes. And is that videotape, was it on your phone? Yes. So when it, law enforcement sees the phone, they would have had access to this video? I believe so, yes. And tell me about it. Um, Lucas likes to watch cartoons and play video games on the big screen, which is, this is the big screen. And um, I would have to call Brian to come over sometimes to help me figure out the fire stick and whatever platform or whatever, whatever it was that Lucas was trying to view his, uh, shows and video games on and I don't remember how um, uh, George found out that Brian had come over I believe because it was actually fixed and he knew that I didn't know how to do it um, found out that Brian had come over to fix it and was he jealous of Brian? I don't know if he was jealous of Brian I think that he had a Fear that I somehow would go back to Brian. So I, I think by Brian helping me with things for Lucas, um, he just didn't want him to be interacting with me at all. So Lucas wasn't over here this day, was he? No. Brian wasn't over here this day. Um, he may have been. I can't remember when he actually fixed the television for Lucas. But y'all were drinking this day. I'm, I'm, I know he was for a fact, yes. Cancer's on you? Probably so, yes. Okay. I would agree. So how did it end up badly? Um, he accused me of sucking Brian's dick and told me that he was going to break my face with the bat 
that he was going to make me unrecognizable to my son with the bat. And then told me that he's going to destroy my fucking television. And then I was going to remove it from the apartment. And if I didn't, I was going to be, again, unrecognizable to my son. So did he grab the bat? Absolutely. He already had, had that in his hand, and he told me that I had to videotape it. Did you videotape it voluntarily? No. This is George. That particular day, hold the bat. Yes, telling me that I'm going to take the television out once he destroys it. He wanted you to take the television out? That, or I was going to help him, but either way, I was... Picking a part and removing it. And what is this picture of? The process of him destroying my television. While you're videotaping? Correct. Is that the result? No. After that, he ripped it off of the TV stand. Did he later pass out? Yep. That usually does. What's he drinking into? I, I don't know. God put in something, I'm sure. Did you recognize that? Can I let him in the stairwell? Pardon me. Would that, was that a photograph taken by a crime scene? Correct. Is that a fair and accurate depiction of your um, living room and stairwell? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about this room? Um, this is my living room. Um, this wall that we have over here with the hearts. Um, that's where we would display all of our artwork. We were in the process of taking it down to add more um, so he could continue to be entertained. The bookshelf over here is my son's bookshelf with all of his toys and little guns and uh, musical instruments. He's got a little karaoke machine down here, his guitar. The stand right here with the red bucket on it, that was the television stand. And then my back porch area and the, the dog bed here. Okay. And then most likely in front of the bookshelf at the uh, foot of the uh, stairs is, is that a doggy? It's a baby gate, but um, my dogs would wander upstairs sometimes and go to the bathroom sometimes when we couldn't get them out. So I would at nighttime, um, or whenever we weren't home, make sure that they didn't go upstairs. And plus Penny was blind. Yeah. There's an allegation that you push George down the stairs? Apparently. Or got him in the suitcase upstairs and pushed him down the stairs? Supposedly. Did that occur? Absolutely not. Is that bookshelf disturbed in any way? No, nor the plant next to it. Did you look at those two and see if you recognize them? Yes, this is me sitting on the back porch with my dogs. And as you can see that, we are both drinking. All right, who's taking the picture? I'm guessing George's, or maybe it's one at Lucas... I don't focus on here, so it had to be George. How can you tell y'all were drinking? Because there's a cup here, and then he has a beer. All right. And uh, there's two dogs. There's one sitting next to you. Who's that? That's Penny. She's the blind dog. I used to have to pick her up to put her somewhere so she would stay there because she um, was unfamiliar with the area, especially since we moved from my marital home to the um, townhouse. So most of the time, Penny would be close or next to me. Who's next to the film? Um, this is little guard dog, Tess. Um, she was the deaf dog. Um, and this is the fence here. Well, I'll, I'll show them. Okay. Um, but this is Tess, and then this is Pe deaf, blind. Penny and Tess. All right, and then the second one. This is Tess on the back porch. Taking a nap. She was never far from me. All right. When George was sober, how did he treat the dog? Nice. I don't know if he was a, a pet person, what, what but I mean, he was he was nice. If I needed him to feed them, they he would feed them. Were there times when George was drinking where he would threaten to harm the dogs? All the time. One of the worst, one of the worst threats was Penny being blind. Um, he would um, actually leave the gate open in the back. He wouldn't threaten me to do it. He would actually do it. 
um, on nights that I had to go up to sleep or some, I, I fled the night before or something, um, and would tell me that he hoped that I would come back and find her bloated body dead in the pond across the way from our townhome. And Tess was notorious if I wasn't there to go look for me and would say that uh, he would hope that I would have to scrape up her dead body from the, the street that was out in front of our uh, apartment complex. Why was George upset with you? Why would he threaten to go on the dog? Anything that he could get to try to have some type of hold over me. Control? And he knew I loved my dogs very much, especially that they were handicapped. Were they afraid of him? Yes. Uh, Penny would hear his voice and instantly go underneath um, the dining room table that we had. Um, Tess was always fractious and very, very quick with his movements, but she was never, never far away. They never showed their teeth. They never growled. Tess would occasionally bark, but it was very rare. And he used to kick them and just... For what reason would he kick them? Penny would try to find me because she's, she's blind. Speculating the mind of the dog. Sustained. Can you describe this for the jury? This is again, it's our back porch, and this is the fence that I made for the dogs to have a little bit extra space. Um, Penny is next to me. She's the blind dog, and then Tess is down here at Garden the Gate. Are right, these fake rabbits? Is that yes. Um, I used to call my son when he was a baby. He was my bunny rabbit. Overruled. Overruled. Um, he was my bunny rabbit, so I used to collect bunnies, bunny rabbits. And so I have rabbits here and there throughout my house and um, in my little garden area. All right, this is the alcohol you are consuming? Yes. Right. And this is a uh, close-up of which one? This is Tess. She's the deaf dog. How old were these dogs at that time, 2020? Gosh, maybe nine, maybe ten. <clears throat> Let me go back to the night earlier in the evening when uh, I think y'all may have been out on the back patio and uh, you had suggested to George to call the children, but then uh, did, he, did he call his brother or he, his brother called George? Do you remember? George called his brother. And you made a statement about telling telling something. So explain that to the to the jury. Um, I told him to tell his brother about you choking me the other day. This is a separate choking incident. Um, we had been drinking, and I had. I wanted George to tell him, but he didn't tell him, so I said it in the background. So he would be aware. What did you tell him? Tell him why you choked me, or that you choked me. You heard the testimony of the two neighbors, the boys that lived next to you? Yes. <coughs> and uh, you heard that they were they were actually questioned, I think, the, um, the audio. They were audio interviewed. You heard from Detective Copsel. I think it was two or three, a couple of days later on the 25th of February or 27th of February. Yes. And uh, you heard their testimony earlier this week. Yes. Where they hear a kind of a thumping sound starting at the top of the steps, ending up, ending at the bottom. Yes. Have they got the knife roll? Yes. To explain to the jury that. So it was the night before. Um, again, I was sleeping, and in the middle of the night, with the door barricaded, he came in and ripped me out of the bed. Um, and first got me with one hand, and then both got both hands and pulled me completely off of the bed. And then, like a caveman, had my hair like this and was going down the stairwell, taking me with him. Uh, to come downstairs so um, I could sit and drink with him. Do you believe that's the noise that the uh, the two neighbor boys heard? I absolutely do. And it was just the night before? Correct. Now, s 
Some of the time when this abuse occurred, you called the police. Yes. And other times the police were not called. Right. I want to refer to you the first time, I believe, you mentioned the 911 call. I believe that was July 25th of 2018. Yes. That was the incident in which Georgia kicked you in the eye. Stomped me, yes. Stomped you in the eye. And you had grabbed his neck? Yes, I was able to uh, get my arms out from him pinning me down with his knees and grab his neck. So law enforcement came, investigated. Yes. And both of you were arrested. Right. Do you recall asking the officer when you were arrested, why am I being arrested? Many times, yes. Do you, do you recall asking the officer, why am I being arrested? Yes. Do you recall making any other statements to law enforcement as to why you did what you did to George? That was the first time ever that I actually officially fought back. Did you tell the officer that you were fighting back? Yes, because I was in complete shock that I was getting arrested because of it. Now, on the, um, the two-minute video, the suitcase video, you mentioned to him, I think you said something, I can't breathe. He said, I can't breathe, and you said, that's how I feel when you're choking me. Were you referring to an isolated incident of the, the night before, two nights before, or whenever, or what were you referring to in general? In general, the more than two or three more times that he had done it. Okay. And then uh, the part about cheating, he didn't physically cheat on No, he did not. Okay. And just, I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but what, what are you referring to there? Um, George was, I believe, addicted to pornography, and a lot of that would be found on my phone from him supposedly wanting to call up <laughs> job interviews. And um, as a solution, I sat him down and I explained to him, to me, that's you visualizing yourself with someone else, um, or at least having a pleasurable moment with someone else or watching other people. And to me, I told him that I considered that cheating on me. Okay. And so he, he would download that on your phone? Yes. Why did you stay As, you got to tell the juror. As anyone who has ever been in love or when you love someone or primarily someone or something, you go above and beyond and you tolerate and you endure and you persevere and you try to make that person, person as spectacular as you possibly can, no matter the sacrifice that you may have to go through um, to serve someone else um, in a positive light so they can be better people for um, themselves and to just make them a happier person. And love, love is very strong and love is very deep. And love, I believe, is not fully understood in a lot of ways for how different people react to it. And I very much deeply and passionately love George. I love him to this day. Did you not want to be alone? Um, at the beginning, um, through my divorce, um, it was very nice to have him around and he was in he was a man-man to me, and um, I felt protected, and he's very nice, and as lame as it sounds, he used to compliment me, and it makes, it made my day. So, yes. During that period of time, when uh, you first started seeing George, would it be fair to say that you had low self-esteem? Yes. Now, we talked about this previous arrest where you told the officer you were fighting back and you got arrested. Now, I want to talk about your conversations with law enforcement. But first, I want to ask you, why did you go to the police station that day when you were interrogated there? We saw the two-hour video. Tell the jury. Um, the day of the incident, um, 
the detective Copsell gave me her business card with her personal cell phone number on it and said if I happen to remember anything or anything that I would like to add to the day for me to um, not hesitate to give her a call. So throughout the rest of the evening, I just, something was off. I, I didn't feel comfortable with what she told me and how she told it to me. How long were you at the scene? Gosh, all day from the moment that they were there to the moment that the coroner's van um, drove off. All right, when, when it ended, did you stay in your home? No, I raced inside and collected some pajamas and a toothbrush and I um, went over to where my son was at my ex-husband's house. Did you take the dogs? I didn't even feed them, it was so fast. All right, and then once you got over to your uh, ex-husband's, what happened? Is it released to Detective Coppel? Coppel? Something just wasn't sitting right with me, and I, I had a suspicion that she just wasn't being honest with me, so I took it upon yeah, myself. Sustained. So you called her. Tell, tell us about that. Um, I called her, and I told her that... I felt that she was being dishonest with me. Um, she originally had told me that due to her being pregnant, it would just be a lot easier for her to have me come down to the station um, to pick up my phone. The original plan was for she and uh, Detective Lohan to return the phone to my apartment. Uh, but she said that um, it would be a lot easier for me to just come down and pick it up because I remember when I was pregnant, that's what she said. You remember when you were pregnant. So um, I said, I feel that you're tricking me, and I feel that you're being very sneaky about something, and I don't believe that you're being honest with me. And I said, regardless, I'm still going to come. Sustained. So you agreed to come, but you understood it was to get your phone? Correct. All right, you came that afternoon to the station? I did. And the original agreement was they were to come to you? Correct. All right. When you got to the station, what happened? Um, I thought I was just going to be picking up my phone. I had, I mean, my car was there. I had everything in my car. It was just a regular, I'm just going to go in, maybe sign something and pick up my phone. And there's people that are, um, over here at the windows. And I thought that I was supposed to go over there to get my phone. And Detective Lowen came down and, um, said that my phone was upstairs. So if I would just follow him upstairs, that's where my phone was. And then I was taken into a, I guess it was an interrogation room and they told me to sit down and that um, then I guess the interview or interrogation began and I just simply kept getting my phone. Ms. Ben, tell the jury why you lied to the police. I lied to the police, basically everyone, because I was extremely fearful of being arrested. I made the first attempt of me calling 911 by telling them what happened, and I thought they, they were going to help me, but instead I was arrested for calling 911. So you made the decision to lie? I did. Did you stay with that lie? I did. Are you telling the truth today? I am. Now let me take you back to the um, to this incident. Is it fair to say that when George Torres is sober, he commits no violence against you? No. Is that fair to say? Yes. Is it fair to say that every time that he's intoxicated or every time that you're hit by him or harmed by him, it's when he's intoxicated? Yes. As a result, when he's drinking, does it change your outlook? Yes. Could you explain that to the jury? I'm always fearful. Um, paranoia. Why? I, Why? Because I try to protect and defend myself for fear something happens at the last ultimate second. But you're always that way, fearful. Is it because of these prior incidences? Absolutely. Do you try to placate it? All the time. What do you what do you mean? I with the puzzles and the painting and 
feeding the ducks across the way at the pond, um, listening to music, trying to go for a walk on the trail, anything that I possibly can. I told you I was running out of things to entertain him with. Why, why do you think, George, what, what, what bothers him? Sustained. Does he, does he tell you? What he, Sustained. As a result of how he, he behaves towards you in that intoxicated state, how were you feeling the night of this event? Objection. Answered. Overruled. Extremely nervous. Um, anxiety galore. Just, I can never relax. When he's drinking? Yes. And the state of intoxication that he was at at the time of this event, is that the state that scares you the most? <clears throat> it's the tone, yes. There's a lot of alarms and red flags that go on throughout the day or night or whenever it is that we are drinking. Tell, tell us about tell us about that. How that heightens does that heighten your sense of safety? At all times. But especially when he's drinking? Oh, yes, all the time. And then his mood? Yes, it depends on what mood he's in that day. Well, do you have, do you have like a sixth sense of how he's doing? Yes, I knew George very well. Um, sure. I'm yes, sir. Sustained. Can you tell us what you mean by that? Sixth sense or knew, knew him very well? I guess you can say that I was trained by fear with him. Just, it's it wasn't fun anymore when we would drink and we would uh, hang out on the back porch. It wasn't fun anymore because I knew inevitably that something was going to happen to me one way or another. You know, those, those bruises that we saw of him, they look pretty deep. Tell the jury what you were thinking. From the bat, you're... Yes. I didn't want to die that night. I I can't describe it to you. It's terrifying love to a certain degree where my plan was to show him the next day and just I I wanted him to be better and treat me nicer and be the person that he was when I originally met him. And I knew that was in him still. I knew that it could be found and I just couldn't figure out what it was that I was doing wrong in order for it to not be back to where that was. And I was tired of living in fear and just sick all the time of figuring out how I can entertain him so I don't die and uh, continue a relationship with my son and try to live a normal life, that wasn't a normal life for me. And just, I, I, bottom line is I didn't want to die. I would have, I would have died or I would have been disfigured or maimed or if, if it weren't me with a bat, it would have been him if he were to have gotten out. That's all. Any cross-examination? Did George know somebody named Crystal? Did you ever mention Crystal in your text messages about being one of his bitches? Don't know. I don't remember. How about Christine? Did George know a Christine? I don't know. How about a Pamela Erickson? These may have been people that he was communicating with on whatever the platform was. On your phone? I believe so, yes. And did you find these communications? I believe I found one or two of them from some of them. And did you send a long letter to his family uh, to relate to him about George and his girls that he was cheating on you with. I believe so. Okay, so you do you do know those names, right? I don't remember them. It's been however long. Okay. Now, on February twenty fourth, twenty twenty, you called nine one one at about one p.m. Correct? Yes. And at that point, you were still feeling a little intoxicated, were you not? It was more shock. Yes. Okay. So you agree that you previously stated I was still, I believe, intoxicated to a degree? 
To a degree, yes. So 1 p.m., that's, that's about 14 hours after 11 p.m. the night before, correct? I'm guessing so. Right. Well, 12 hours prior would be 1 a.m., and then 12 a.m. is 13 hours, 11 p.m. is 14 hours, correct? Okay. And you were present here for the medical examiner, Dr. Zadovich, to testify, correct? Yes. And you heard her talk about all the effects of ethanol that has on the human body, correct? Yes. And she also mentioned something that it, on average, dissipates at about 0 0.015 an hour. Do you recall that? I believe so. Okay. So would it be fair to say that if you're still, still feeling the effects of the alcohol at 1 p.m., so it's 14 hours... 0.015. You were at approximately about a 0.21 at 11 p.m. the night before. Do you feel like you were two and a half times the legal limit at that time? I don't know how you came to that number. Judge, I, I'll object. Approach. So you testified earlier that you all had about half of one of these bottles left from the night before, correct? Yes. And so would you agree that? This is one of the three bottles that was purchased between February 22nd and the two that were purchased on February 23rd, 2020. I'm guessing it is like the bottle, yes. All right, and it's 1.5 liters. Would you agree? Yes. And when you say half, were we talking about to the top of the label was left from the day before? Oh, goodness, no. All right, a little less, halfway through the label? Right about. Okay, about halfway through the label. So in addition to halfway through the label, which began consuming after going to public at about 12.15, correct? Oh, yeah. So you, you all would have been, began consuming around 12.30, is it fair to say, when you got back? I've been calling back later. Okay. And after finishing what you all had left over from Saturday, the two of you consumed two 1.5 liter bottles, correct? I'm not sure about the second bottle that he purchased, if it was empty or not at the time. Well, you did mention that the police would find two empty bottles in the top of your trash, correct? Yes. And we did all see that in the photographs, correct? See that two. in the garbage, yes. yes. All right, and you say you were about 100 pounds at the time? Yes. And we all know Mr. Torres was 103 pounds at the time of his death, correct? That's what they say. All right, so that's three liters of wine between 200 pounds split between two people over the course of a day, correct? Yes. And you testified uh, today that you were intoxicated uh, at the time that this occurred. Uh, the videos between 11 and 11.30 at night, correct? Yes, at some level, yes. All right. Now, what does that mean to you? Uh, previously, have you indicated that that means the room is spinning? Do you, do you ever recall saying that? I do. So what was your level of intoxication at this point in time when the first video was filmed at 11, 12 p.m.? Do you mean from lack of sleep or alcohol? From the alcohol. What was my level? What were you feeling? Did you have trouble with your balance? I was more tired than anything. Did you have trouble with your balance? I don't believe so. So you were able to flip a suitcase over with a hundred pound man in it, right? I mean, yes, it happened. Okay. How about your speech? Do you feel like your speech was slurred? Clearly. How about your inhibitions? Do you feel like you were doing things that you wouldn't do when you were sober? I wasn't thinking about that. Well, on reflection, do you feel like this is something you would have done when you were sober? I didn't know me and George. I'm just asking you, looking back on this, when he's in the suitcase and you're telling him how you feel, and then you wait 11 minutes and you film another 22 seconds and then you go upstairs, Upon reflection, is that something you would have done and left him in there had you not been drinking? I don't know. I can't say. Okay. If I was scared, then it would be something. Okay. All right. Now, 
Today you testified about the time frame between the two videos, correct? Yes. So you came down from the shower where you were hiding, correct? Yes. And as you're coming down the stairs, before you even get to the bottom of the stairs, you can kind of see over your shoulder or towards your right that he's trying to hide in the suitcase, correct? Yes. And the lid is down, but it's not closed, and you can, you can tell he's hiding in there. It's not a great hiding spot just yet, right? Right. And so you come over to him, and you're laughing, right? Yes. And you move the suitcase around some before zipping it shut, right? No. No? You immediately zip it shut? Yes. Okay. And you're both still laughing about it, correct? Correct. All right. And then it's during this course of time. How quickly is it after you zip it shut that you begin filming the first video? I don't know without watching it. I don't, I don't know. Okay. I mean, the video is not going to catch you zipping him up because you're like 10 feet away, right? How, how quickly after you zip him up is it before the video starts is my question. I don't know. Okay. And then during that 9 minutes and 14 seconds, is when he begins to get angry, correct? What, nine minutes? Then? Between the two videos. There's nine minutes and 14 seconds between the end of 1061 and uh, the beginning of 10, six, or 1062 and 1063. So you got the two minute, three second video that starts at 11, 12, 45, correct? I guess. All right, so we're looking at entry 31107. That indicates, uh, according to the phone extraction, 223. 2020, 11, 12, 45 p.m., image underscore 1062 movie begins being captured. And we have seen that that is about two minutes and three seconds. Entry 31113 indicates that image underscore 1063 dot move. 31113, a second movie is captured at 11, 23, 03 p.m. Your testimony was that after that first video was captured by your phone and you, Mr. Torres began getting angry and trying to push his way out, correct? Say it one more time, please. Between these two movies, of which there's about nine minutes and 14 seconds, Mr. Torres begins to get angry and try and push his way out, and get out of the suitcase, correct? He had been angry on and off throughout the entire day. Okay, you didn't tell us that earlier. You said it was a wonderful, fun day all day, correct? because I lived. Okay. But you did not tell us earlier today that he had been angry throughout the day. When would I say that? You described your entire day of doing puzzles, arts and crafts, and outside by the dartboard, and you said it was a wonderful day and everything was fun uh, until he was in the suitcase. Did you not testify to that earlier today? I did. Okay. My specific question between these two movies is, this is when he begins to get angry and trying to push his way out and to get out of the suitcase, correct? Angry again, yes. Okay. And he was expressing his anger in what manner? How did he say this? At which point throughout the day? Ma'am, you know very well that I'm talking about between these movies. Please answer my question. Between these two movies, how did he express his anger with you? Told me that I was going to fucking die. Okay. Now this is happening after he's already told you several times he cannot breathe in the suitcase, correct? Correct. And he's been in there for whatever brief amount of time it took you to zip him up and it's the laughter stops and then you go over and begin to film, correct? Yes. And you're filming. Your purpose of filming is to kind of teach him a lesson. This is your chance to say something to him when he can't say anything back to you, correct? No. Then correct me. There was no lesson to be learned. It was just I wanted him to try to understand how I felt so maybe he could progress in being a better person the next day. So... You wanted him to understand how you felt in the past, and that's not teaching a lesson? I just wanted him to understand. Okay. All right, and so immediately prior to zipping him up, 
in putting him into the movie, you had been upstairs, correct? I'm sorry? Immediately to come, before coming down and, and zipping him up and then filming the first of the two movies, you had been upstairs in the shower, correct? Yes. Does this appear to be the blue suitcase that's in the two videos that were captured at 11.12 and 11.23 p.m.? Correct. Did you take this image at 11.03 p.m.? I, I don't remember if I did or not. And again, we had, uh, and by we, I mean you and Mr. Torres, two 1.5 liters bottles of wine and plus whatever was left over from the day before, correct? That's correct. So do you, you don't remember taking this photograph? I don't. Do you remember whether or not Mr. Torres was in here? I don't remember taking the photo. Okay. So what is your memory of what happens between 11.03 p.m. and 31 seconds when that image is captured and then when the movie starts at 11.12.45. What do you remember? I don't. Okay. Do you remember anything from that night? I do. You told the police on February, or February 25th, 2020, when they first showed you the video that you didn't remember taking that. Do you remember that? I do. And your testimony is you do remember taking that video. I do. But you don't remember taking that photograph nine minutes prior. Correct. Is there something, did you have more to drink in those nine minutes? I did not. Was Mr. Torres in that suitcase the entire time between 11.03 when that image was taken and then when the second video was taken at 11.23 p.m.? I believe so, yes. So for 20 minutes? Yes? However long the time frame is. Did he begin telling you that he couldn't breathe before the video or do you not remember? I don't remember. Now. You testified moments ago that um, your two neighbors must have misremembered which night the loud noise was, correct? Yes. And now you're telling us that you don't remember taking the photograph at 11.03 p.m., correct? Correct. Did the police come out to your uh, townhouse on Sunday, February 23rd, 2020? Yes. I'm talking about Sunday. This is the Sunday fun day when we're going to Publix twice. Were the police out of your residence? No. It was the day after, Monday the 24th. Correct? Yes. That Monday morning, you called 911, well, Monday afternoon at about 1 p.m., correct? Yes. Between that time frame, you were the only person in your apartment plus Mr. Torres in the suitcase, correct? Yes. So if anything had been disturbed in your apartment, you had all the time that you wanted to to undisturb them before calling 911, correct? If I wanted to. Okay. And you still, your testimony is there was no loud boom that shook the walls of your townhouse at about 11 p.m. the night of February 23rd, 2020, correct? Correct. To the best of your memory, correct? Correct. That second video is 22 seconds where you just hear him say Sarah and you don't say anything or you're familiar with that video, correct? Yes. It's after that that you go upstairs, correct? Yes. How quickly is it that you go upstairs after that? It was pretty quick. Can you grab the dogs? No, the dogs were upstairs already. Okay. Did you uh, call 911 and let the police know that you had zipped somebody shut in a suitcase and they had not been able to get out for 20 minutes? I did not. Did you go to Brian's house and tell him I had to zip Mr. Torres up in a suitcase shut? Um, we need to do something about that before he passes. I believe that's what the phone call was. Okay. Well, what do you remember now about the phone call with Brian? I I know that I called him. I I'm not, I don't know specifically what it was about. Now. Your testimony, it seems like you spend day after day finding things to entertain Mr. Torres to do, correct? Yes, sir. Almost like having a child. You have, you have your own child, correct? I do. What you described sounded like having a small child. Would you agree? That's your interpretation. Okay. Well, you take him from doing arts and crafts to doing puzzles, so on and so forth, correct? When he's been drinking, yes. Mr. Torres 
was notorious for doing some of these things, correct? What do you mean? Well, you described Mr. Torres as being notoriously known for doing things. You described your ex-husband, Brian Boone, notorious for doing things like nagging and calling all the time. You remember your testimony calling people notorious for doing things? Yes. What would you say people would say you're notorious for? I don't know. And you would not answer Brian Boone, your ex-husband's phone calls, just so that you could let him know that you're busy and you have things going on, correct? I knew that at whatever time it was that he was calling me that he could wait for the few moments of me getting up to where Lucas gets off school, out of school at three o'clock. Okay. But you wouldn't return his call. You would let him call several times, correct? That day, yes. Okay. How about other days? Would he have to call to remind you to get Lucas on other days? He wasn't reminding me. He was just making sure that uh, Lucas was, was covered for a pickup okay. or drop off. All right. You didn't mention uh, to the sheriff's office either February 24th or February 25th about going to Publix with Mr. Torres at noon or 1217, did you? I don't recall. So the best, the best evidence of that would be the recording of those interviews? Correct. Did you not remember going to Publix with Mr. Torres that day? At what point? At any point. No, I didn't. You uh, had indicated to the police that um, it was about 4 p.m. that you all had started drinking after doing chores. Do you recall that? I do. And your testimony today was that it was really more after you guys went to public at about 12, 17 p.m., correct? Yes. And you did not tell the truth to the police, correct? I'm sorry. You did not tell the, tr the truth to the police about that, correct? I did not. And when they were asking you about Mr. Torres' injuries, you told them that you had nothing to do with it, correct? Yes. And that was not the truth? Correct. What did y'all have for breakfast on the uh, 23rd? I don't remember. Did y'all have lunch? I believe we had leftovers from, I think, something that we had in the fridge. And do you recall what those were? No, not at this point, no. And then I believe you mentioned having a sandwich of some sort for dinner? No, I believe it was for, I'm guessing he and I ate at the same time. At one point, Mr. Torres called his brother Juan, correct? Yes. And do you admit that you were yelling in the background, telling Mr. Torres to tell his brother that he had been choking you? I don't know if I was yelling. I know that I, he could hear me through the phone. Okay. So how long has that been going on that day? When did you start uh, getting on Mr. Torres about choking you in the past? I had, he and I had had conversations about it um, because he didn't remember doing it to me. And um, the next day and the day of, is it fair to say that there are just points in time where you don't remember what you do either, correct? Are you talking about almost five years ago? I'm talking about from drinking. Is it fair to say that you don't often remember things that you did while you were drinking? I would not say often. Okay. In the course of relations with Mr. Torres, are there things you don't remember happening that happened the night before between you and him? I can't say that at this point. But you said that you don't remember taking that photograph at 11.03 p.m. on February 23rd, correct? Yes. Was there anything else that you were telling Mr. Torres that he needed to tell his brother? Not that I can recall. Okay. Was there anything you were telling him that he needed to tell his daughters? Not that I can recall. Now, you indicated that Mr. Torres would use your phone to look at pornography? Correct. Were there ever any points in times when it was you that was used looking at pornography? Um, if I was, it was to go back and look to see. Did you ever threaten to get Mr. Torres arrested if he did not do what you wanted him to do? 
I wouldn't say threatening. Okay. Well, were there ever points in times where you would like him to call you or return a call? And if he didn't do that, um, you would threaten to get him arrested? It depends on if he had my keys or something that I needed from him. Okay. And it was your townhouse, correct? Mine, yes. Plus ours. Well, you, when did you get him off the lease? Uh, I, I'm not sure what um, year it was, but I don't think he was actually removed from the lease. Okay. He was made a different type of tenant. Did you change the locks so that he couldn't get back in at the points of times when you picked him out? I did, sometimes. Okay. And then would you leave the key in the hiding spot that he was aware of? There were multiple hiding places. Okay. On any of the 911 calls, did you ever mention that Mr. Torres was aware of where you kept your keys and that's how he got back into the house? I didn't know I needed to. Okay. He would never break into my home. All right. It's your testimony that you did not push him down the stairs, correct? Yes. And, in fact, it was him that dragged you down the stairs the night before, correct? Yes. Now, by dragged, were, did you leave your feet? Yes. And did you get scrapes on your knees or anywhere from the carpet? I'm not sure. I mean, did you get any injuries, like bruises or abrasions or scrapes? Um, I was missing a lot of my hair. Yes, that was on the stairwell. Okay. And... You agree that you were photographed on February 24th when the police came out, correct? The day of the incident? Well, the afternoon after the incident. We're not sure when he passed. Yes. Some of those photographs showed ashtrays inside your house. Were you, I thought you said you guys couldn't smoke inside your house. We couldn't. But you did. Right? Sometimes, yes. And you agree you would go to the hospital and tell them things that were not true, correct? Yes. There were times where you would go to the hospital and leave without getting treatment, correct? Yes. And is it fair to say that you often had alcohol in your system when you were going to the hospital, correct? Sometimes. Just to summarize the day to make sure we understand it. You all wake up sometime in the morning, but it's an unknown time, correct? On February 23rd. Or early afternoon. I Yes, I had a problem with the detectives and them having me guesstimate times. Okay. Are you the kind of person, like most of us, that uses your phone when you wake up? No. So the first activity on your phone may have nothing to do with when you woke up. Is that fair for you? Yes, other than looking at the time, possibly. Okay. So at some point you wake up, it doesn't sound like you have breakfast, correct? Right. You do some chores, correct? Yes. So that is true. That part of it is true. You did do chores before going to Publix at 1217? Yes. All right. After chores, you go to Publix and you get that 1.5 liter Magnum bottle of Woodbridge Chardonnay, correct? I'm not sure what Magnum is. 1.5 liters. Instead of the 750s, it's the double size. It's like two bottles of wine. Okay, yes. So you got a 1.5 liter, right? Yes, it is the larger bottle. And you got home. And you at 100 pounds and Mr. Torres at 103 pounds began drinking this wine, correct? I'm, I'm guessing so. I'm not going to guess times. Well, don't guess. I mean, you got home from Publix. When was your first drink? I'm not sure. I mean, we could have continued to do uh, whatever was left over from what we didn't do before we went to Publix. Okay. So you may have drank, started drinking even later, correct? Then? 12.30 when you get back from Publix? I, I, I don't know. Okay. Was it 1.30 or 2.30 when you began drinking? I don't know. All right. Was it before any of the phone calls to the brothers and, the, and his daughters? Yes. And so you drink what's left in the, mag the bottle of wine from the day before that's halfway labeled, correct? At some point. And then you drink 1.5 liters of wine and he goes out and gets another one on his own without your permission or suggestion about 5.30, correct? Correct. And then you all consume that one as well and it ends up in the trash can at the end of the night, correct? Apparently. Okay. At what point in the night does your memory tape stop? Because you've described that it wasn't on at 11.03 p.m. when that photograph was taken. What's the last thing you actually do remember prior to these videos being made? 
I I don't recall it at this point. I I, I don't remember. Okay, so it ends in hide and seek after arts and puzzles, correct? <laughs> he says, "Tag, you're it, but you run and go upstairs and hide, right?" Yes. So does that mean he's it and he's supposed to come find you? No. Okay. Just... So you both hide. No. Okay. How does this work? I, I don't know how to tell you. I, okay. I was it, and I, I went and hid. I mean, my understanding of the rules of hide-and-seek is one person will be it, cover his or her eyes, and count to, like, 20, and then go find the person that's hiding. Is that your familiarity with the rules, too, or do you guys have house rules? Cool. I understand how the okay. hide-and-seek works. So, Explain to me what was your expectation. You go up to the shower. Were you expecting him to come find you? I was. Okay. And after a while, he did not come find you? Yes. And that's when you returned downstairs? Correct. And because of the way your townhouse is set up, you can kind of see over where the suitcase is and that he's trying to hide in there, but it's not successfully hidden just yet. I mean, yes, you have to come down a good ways in order to be able to... Right, right. But you saw, you, you testified those before you got to the bottom. Yes. All right. And then you come over there, and thinking that it's funny, you zip them shut, correct? Yes, we both thought it was funny. Okay. All right, Ms. Boone, can you demonstrate for the jury where Mr. Torres' head was and how his body was positioned in the suitcase, if you don't mind? His back was this way and his head was here. All right, and then is it fair to say his feet are kind of down here, which would be the front left corner from their perspective in the jury box? Yes. And then his knees are kind of tucked up towards his face. If I remember correctly, yes, that's the position. Okay. All right. Can you help me understand how it was that you zip it shut? Can you, can you show us where you say you left uh, an opening that his hand got out of? It, would it be easier to put it down here? I didn't want to make it go down there. If, you, if, you, if you're happy doing that, I'll let you. Hold on. Does she need to be worn gloves? Yes. Agree. She's going to be manipulating it. Were you wanting her to do? Just demonstrate how she zipped it shut. Okay, well, where's the pin put? And do you remember where? Okay. So put it was in. Just the paper clip was on when this event occurred. When we pulled the suitcase out earlier, the paper clip was not attached. So now the prosecutor has attached the paper clip. We don't know if that's the way it was attached. It's not even a paper clip. We don't okay. know if that's the proper way that it was attached. But he's asking her now to pull. Is there an objection? Yes. Approach. Objections overruled. Can we see how it was that the two zipper parts were positioned when you say that Mr. Torres was able to get his hand out? If you want me to do it, I'm fine. I'll take your direction. Um, from what I remember, is this how the suitcase, this how the suitcase was? This was up here. This was not this hard either. So this was like here. Okay. Right here. About right there, ma'am? Sure. Okay. I assume this one was much closer. 
it's not over there? Where did, where did you leave? You asked me where I zipped it. When, when you saw that zip shut, show us. Are you talking about how I zipped it or? When you're done zipping like it shut, he's inside of it, where are the zipper components? Just tell me what to say about I mean, it was the corner. Mm -hmm. you know, it makes the corner look like right I mean, here, it's not. Yes, what? this one was already pretty much. Yes. The one I can remember. That's how he was coming with his hand out. It was like this from the corner part. Okay, does that sound Thank you. You can return to your seat. Did you ever change the position of those zippers once once you put it in that position? I did not. And so once he was zipped into there, there's some amount of time, but you don't remember specifically before you start taking the two minute video, correct? Yes. And then that's when you say what you say, and that's when he says what he says. We've all heard it, correct? And then between there and that second video of the 22 seconds length, it's at this point where he's beginning to get angry. And then that's when you take the baseball bat that's in evidence and your testimony is start poking him with the end of it. Did you say this was the second video? Between the two videos. That's, that's when you started hitting with the bat because he was getting angry and trying to escape, correct? Right. I was not hitting him. I was, yes. Okay. Did you ever hit him with the bat while he was outside of the suitcase? No. So each time that he is hit with the bat, it's through this suitcase. And that's what leaves the marks on him, because you didn't hit him with the bat outside of the suitcase, correct? Yes, I think I did straight. No, that's okay. The suitcase will speak for itself. Um, <coughs> And then you take the second video and you go upstairs and go to bed, correct? I apparently went upstairs and I used the phone to make a phone call. Okay. And then I fell asleep. All right. And at the point in time when you left and went upstairs, he was still inside the suitcase, correct? Correct. Was he still asking for you and calling your name? Not that I can recall. Did you say shh to him again? I don't remember. Did you tell him that this was his problem and it's on you again? Don't remember. Did you do anything to help him escape from the predicament that you zipped him up in? No. No other questions. Any redirect examination? Ms. Boo, he just asked you the question that you, you poked him and you didn't poke it. You poked, every time you poked him hard with the, the bat, he was inside the briefcase. The suitcase, yes. Uh, the suitcase. But you remember when he put his hand out, did you not hit him in the hand outside the suitcase? Yes. Okay. So that was the only time the bat touched Mr. Torres's body outside the suitcase. Yes. Was when you hit him with a hand. But all the other injuries were with you poking him pretty hard. I mean, you bruised your hand, correct? Doing that. Thank you. That's all Ma'am, you can return to counsel's table. Judge, can we approach you? Just a moment. Let me, let, let me get her situated at table, and then we can approach. Wow, I dislike her even more now than I did before her testimony. And of course, I do not believe her. I think she's already proven to everyone that she's manipulative and calculated. But she wants you to know that she's scared and afraid all the time. And she just doesn't know any better. Nope, not happening. And I really hope the jury isn't falling for this crap. Please, oh please, jury, don't let this Samsonite succubus hornswoggle you into the suitcase. Be smarter than that. All right, members of the jury, thank you so much. It is 542. At this point in time, the court's going to go into recess for the evening. I thank you again for your continued service and your attention in this matter. We're going to start tomorrow again at 9 a.m. here in 12 Alpha at the Orange County Courthouse. With that, members of the jury, I'm going to excuse you for the balance of the evening, and thank you so much.
proceeded. Thank you. With regard to these medical records, the court previously today had required by 5 p.m. to address those. Unfortunately, they have not yet been addressed. It is imperative that the state knows what it is we're culling down or redacting. And I understand that you may want to be seeking those in evidence maybe tomorrow. And the state needs to be advised as to what it is that you're seeking to utilize. So where are we in figuring that out? We've had discussions with Ms. Booth. And she claims that every time that he went to the hospital and the medical records would show that it was in relation to some type of domestic violence involving her, we, we've expressed to her that we do not wish to pursue it and introduce those records of George Torres, of his medical records of the different times he went as it relates to their difficulties. Do you understand that? Okay. Ma'am, earlier we had discussed. Anything else to add to that, uh, Mr. Owens? Just that I've explained to her that the lawyers make those decisions. Okay. And uh, I believe she's in agreement now. I just wanted to get it on the record. Understood. All right, so ma'am, I just got a couple follow-up questions, similar to other conversations we've had over the last couple of days. I don't want to know about the specifics of any conversations you've had with you and your attorneys, just whether or not you've had them. You recall earlier today I'd asked you questions about certain rights that you had the ability to decide. Do you recall that conversation that we had, ma'am? It was before you testified. Okay. Do you recall that I advised you that the lawyers get to make most of the strategy determinations at trial? Do you recall that? I do. And do you recall that you said you understood that? Yes. And do you also recall that I advised you of certain rights that you have? Do you recall that? I do. And one of those rights was the right to testify or remain silent. Do you recall that? Yes. And did you understand that? Yes. So this decision uh, is a trial decision as to whether or not there's certain evidence that your lawyers are going to seek to utilize in your defense. Do you understand that? Yes. Do you understand that they are exercising that trial strategy at this time not to pursue those medical records? Okay. Do you have any questions about that? Are you on board with that strategy? Are you still on board with the strategy utilized in your defense? All of it, yes. Are you satisfied with your lawyer's representation of you in this matter? All right. Thank you. Anyway, I'm like two days behind now, so I got to go get started on day four. See you soon. All right. Thank you both very much. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Courts in recess.